Christensen? Here. Thank you. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring? Here. Councilmember Martin? Here. Councilmember Peck? Here. Councilmember Rodriguez? Here. Councilmember Waters? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Great. Um, Tim, have you led the pledge yet? No, I haven't. All right, back to the school days, my friend. Could you lead us? All, right. All right. I pledge allegiance. Allegiance. To the flag. To the flag. flag. Of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the, and to the republic for which it, for which stands. it stands. stands. One, One nation, 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 nation under God. Under God. Indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. All right, great. Thanks, Dr. Waters. All right, just a quick reminder. Uh, uh, anyone wishing to provide public comment during first call public invited to be heard um, will need to uh, watch the live stream of the meeting. And when the call in information is displayed on the screen, like you're seeing right now, please call that number and then uh, we'll call on you um, after, after, uh, after, after it's your turn. Um, calls will be, uh, callers will hear confirmation. They have entered the meeting and, and you'll be told how many people are already participating in the meeting. Callers are then placed on hold and muted until then, until it's your turn, and you'll be called out according to the last three digits of your phone number. So, um, all right, uh, let's move on to approval of minutes. Do we have a, a motion to approve the July 14th, 2020 regular session minutes? So moved. I'll, uh, okay. it's, been, it's been moved and set, it's moved by Councilmember Martin, seconded by Councilmember Peck. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. All right, um, it looks like, um, uh, do we have any agenda revisions? Anybody wants? Councilmember Christensen. Oh. oh, sorry. I see, the revised, I see that there's a revised ordinance for item 10A regarding the dismount zones. Very good, uh, thank yeah, you. I, I see that, but right now, just is there are there agenda revisions or submission, or motions to direct city manager and, and staff to bring back future agenda items? That's really what I'm asking for. Polly? Okay. Um, a while back, um, I requested a um, uh, the police department to report on their use of force. That was mainly to educate the, um, the public. But uh, in the meantime, the Housing and Human Services uh, Advisory Board uh, began a discussion that went over, well, we had many meetings on it, um, on uh, whether we should defund or divert police funding by 10% to housing and human services. I just wanted you to be aware that this was happening, but they decided not to go forward with it. However, it is a concern. Um, but I would like to amend, I know that um, uh, the city manager and uh, the police department is working on that um, use of force statement. I would like to amend it to include um, whether they, whether our police department ever uses medical injections such as was used on Elijah McCain, who was given an injection uh, that was twice as large as his body weight could handle, which resulted in a heart attack for a 23 year old. And I think our community needs to know whether we give injections to people or not. So I would like to amend or add on to that um, that the statement of whether what kind of medical um, uh, whether we use medical injections to calm uh, arrestees. Do I have a second? All right, uh, there, there is no second. But um, Harold, when are you? When, um, when does that? When is the use of force policy coming back? Um, <clears throat> we said we hope hope to have it in a couple of weeks. Rob is getting me the data this week to review as part of that, and we'll have that put together as well as an update on and, the issue. And Councilor Christensen, you are still free to ask that question when they're presenting. I will. I'll okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mayor Beck. Beck, yep. Thank you. Um, 
I, I agree with uh, Councilwoman Christensen, but um, I would like to have this in this report. Not, not only do the police use in any type of injections to calm a, an arrestee or do, do the EMT uh, people use any injections? So just how has that worked? Do we use it at all? Include that in the report. Thank you. We don't need to take a vote, do we, Harold? We can just include something in there, just let them know. Yeah. All right, yeah. I can I can answer part of it. We do use Narcan for um, um, individuals that are um, overdosing on opiates. Opiates. Um, in terms of fire and police, we have paramedics, and so depending on the health condition, we have pro protocols that we follow by physicians in terms of what we use. But that's driven by a different set of medical protocols. But we'll have that in there. All right. Are there any other questions? Okay. All right. That said, let's move on to city manager's report and update on COVID-19. Harold? Uh, Mayor Council. Um, so one thing that I want to touch on is not technically not COVID related, but it is this year. So I did want to report to you all um, that based on our mosquito trapping, um, we are going to be spraying um, on Thursday evening. We are following our policy and notifying those folks that are requesting the shutoffs. Uh, for the spraying, um, we do have our um, our city's mosquito control contractor. It's Vector Disease Control International. Um, they have some informational dashboards. Um, folks can request shutoff service in front of their house. Um, we also um, have a willingness to investigate potential larvicides, um, and we provide email notifications adjacent to the applications on that. Um, we've been trapping mosquitoes since June 15th um, in 12 different locations to determine the trends and actual numbers. Um, and we've been looking at our wet and standing water areas for mosquito larva production. Um, they had the um, first West Nile positive mosquito identified in the three county re region, which is Boulder, Weld, and Larimer. Um, we had individual neighborhood traps exceed 150 adult female mosquitoes. Um, we're gonna, the, the spraying will generally take place in neighborhoods after 9 p.m. Um, the reason we wanted to bring this out to council tonight is because we have been in conversation with Boulder County Health. Um, obviously they are encouraging the spraying of mosquitoes based on the fact that we are continuing to be in the COVID situation um, they want to reduce the likelihood that we add uh, people who develop West Nile disease on top of it. And so this is a, a twofold um, situation that we're getting into, but I uh, wanted to let you all know that we're doing that. The press release will be going out as soon as I update council on this so people can request the shutoffs, but this is related to the broader issues that, that we're seeing in terms of managing other diseases at this time. So that's what we're gonna be doing. I wanted to take this opportunity to remind everyone about the four Ds that we stress. Um, dust to dawn, limit your outdoor, out, outdoor activity. If you're out there, utilize an insect repellent with DEET. Um, dress in the appropriate clothing to avoid being bitten. And if you have any areas in around your property that retain water, make sure that you don't, um, you do something to alleviate that problem. Um, so that's where we are, um, just another piece uh, in the puzzle, not directly related to it, but wanted to reiterate based on our conversations with Boulder County Health, they are encouraging us to do this, uh, to limit, um, you know, um, potential of someone contracting West Nile. Any questions on that? Doesn't look like it, but thank you, Harold. Yeah. Appreciate it. Anything else? Um, yeah, I'm just going to go really quickly over the numbers. Um, if you all want to see the graphs, I can show you the graphs. Let me call that up. Um, generally, again, you're seeing the three-day average in, in Colorado. Um, I'm going to show you the counts if my computer responds. I've been having issues here. Okay. Again, you can see it decreasing. This is really echoing what the governor talked about today in his press conference. Um, we're trying to get those slides, but um, if you look at it, one of the, I think the important 
um, components on that is um, they sort they had a red, orange, um, and green diagram. Boulder County was actually one of the few counties in the front range that was in the orange. Um, as soon as we get that, we will um, provide that to council. Um, again, I'm pointing this out because this is really where a lot of the targeting of the conversations coming in. And when you see the chart associated with Boulder County, you, you're gonna see a significant difference in terms of the age range of, of people that are um, testing positive again, um, higher in the 20 to 29 year old population. And statewide, you can see this general decline. Um, this, this diagram is the one that the governor was referencing today on his, um, um, on his press conference. And, and what you really see is what's happening in, in other communities, when we were at the, the peak in April for us, you could see a 25% positive rate. That's really what they're seeing in some of the um, locations in the, in the states that are considered the hotspots. Today in, in Colorado, um, 4.56. Um, so we've really been hovering around this 5% recently, even with the, the increased number of positive cases in Colorado. Um, Boulder County, <clears throat> again, as I said earlier, is doing um, fairly well um, as, as we look at the rest of many of the counties within the state. Uh, again, you can see the high points in Boulder County. Um, and, and you can see, again, as we watch trends, you're seeing the graphs move in a very similar fashion. The difference in this is I am going to, again, call attention to the y-axis on this one. When you see many places talking about generating hundreds of cases, um, you know, our high point in Boulder has still been 45, um, but you can see the movement in the graph that mimics what we're seeing at the state level. Um, the last few days have been pretty good. We're still um, probably a few days to a week out of seeing what the impact is of the new masking order and um, the closures of uh, establishments after 10 p.m. Um, but hopefully the data will continue trending in this direction. Um, this is the five-day rolling average of percentage COVID-19 positive PCR test. Um, again, you can see the difference. We've really been trending in Boulder County below 4% um, in those tests. And then when you look at the number of tests that, that are being done, again, you're seeing, uh, remember the 500 number, which was the... Um, I think the Harvard study that indicated what we needed to try to do on a daily basis um, to get a look at what's going on in our community. And you're really seeing here uh, that they're, they're moving above that number. And we're, we're not hearing of any issues with testing. Um, I know driving today at one of the drive-through sites uh, on Main Street, there were a number of cars there with folks getting tested. Uh, but again, um, large number of tests a um, few positives below um, the 45 range is what we're seeing. Um, this is the graph that I wanted to show you. When, when you looked at the state graph in terms of where um, the positive tests are being generated, um, you know, the state had more of this gradual incline like this. What we're really seeing um, in Boulder County it is again in this 20 to 29 year old population. And that's where you're seeing a lot of the, um, the work being done in terms of communicating um, with, with the um, public information that they're putting out, especially as the university is getting ready to go in session. The county has um, worked to, they are creating a um, situation where they work or a program where they work with individuals from the community. And I know they're really focused on um, trying to get some college age students on that group so they can, um, you know, increase the communication in this age range. Uh, once again, uh, five day average of number of new cases. Um, again, you can see the movement, the high peak down, up, and then you can see it's starting to vacillate and we hope we can continue on this trend. Um, residents, this is per 100,000. Uh, again, want to point out what you're seeing is Lafayette moving up in the per 100,000, even though they don't have 100,000. Same for Louisville. But when you look at the actual number of cases, uh, Boulder is now at 707. We're at 626. Um, 
again, that is really directly, you can really start seeing those age demographics starting to play in the community numbers and the number of people testing positive. Uh, and then this is the demographics in terms of uh, white, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, Latin, X in the different communities. Um, if you'll remember last week, I talked to you, I think it was 36, I can't remember if it was with council or with the uh, city wide WebEx. At one point it was 36.8, another point 36.2, now 35.9%. So you're actually seeing this number start to drop, which then is starting to correspond with where you're seeing the age demographics in terms of um, who who is testing positive. Um, this is a good one. Uh, again, this talks about what we're seeing in long-term care facilities versus not associated with it. I think the good news for us as we continue working in this, you saw we were really hit hard in long-term care facilities early on in this, um, not necessarily seeing that at this point. Um, and then this is where we stand in terms of hospital services in Boulder County. Um, again, I do have access to some other data sets that gets more detailed in terms of what's available, but we're still in, in pretty good shape. Um, a lot of people will, will draw attention to this available med surge beds. Again, um, I put the caveat that, that we are still doing elective procedures and other um, normal hospital work, so, so that will adjust this. But in terms of ICU beds available, uh, non-critical vents and critical vents were still in really good shape in terms of the hospital system. As of yet, I haven't heard of anything locally in terms of us being at capacity. Um, I have had that question recently based on what people are seeing um, um, in areas in other states. Stop sharing. Um, so we're still in, in, in pretty good shape in terms of hospital capacity. Uh, and I haven't heard anything where, where individuals are getting concerned now. I think the big thing that if you look at the takeaway from what the governor said today, uh, this really is about, um, as you've heard me say before, keeping um, our numbers down so that we can continue moving forward in terms of supporting um, everyone in our community, but especially our business owners and the people that are employed by these businesses because they are making decisions based on the numbers. What the governor did indicate today in his press conference is that if they see surges in counties where there are variances, they will reach out and contact them and they have to have a pretty aggressive plan to minimize those surges, they will watch it. If they're not able to do that, they'll actually remove some of the variances that the counties have already have, that they have in play. So again, really important for us to, um, know, manage three things, wear our masks, socially distance, and wash our hands. Uh, I may have mentioned it to this group, there was a really interesting medical study out that said if we do those three things, um, it has the potential to be almost as impactful as a vaccine. So those are the things we need to do. Um, we obviously now internally within the organization, we have opened up the library, which is good. Um, most of our facilities are now opened up to a certain extent where they're not fully open. Um, and I know it's frustrating to some of our residents where we have to register for things we're not normally used to registering for. Um, I know there was an email regarding swimming pool use at sunset. And, you know, we do that on a 14 day period. Uh, we know people are almost waiting for that next 14 day cycle to come open to register. Uh, but we're watching that pretty close to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to use it, but it is a registration format. And that's how we're going to work on a number. That's how many of our programs are working. You may hear another question about the library because we are requiring masks within our library. And you go, well, what about the health exemptions? The difference in that is because we're providing alternate options for individuals like curbside pickup and some of the other things. It actually does allow us to, to have a, a, a slightly stronger stance on that. And that's also part of what we have to do in terms of the requirements that we have in terms of sanitizing the number of things people touch and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we're continuing to move forward. Uh, you know, we are continuing to, to really watch our staff in terms of um, people who get sick. 
Um, you know, before I was saying we have no more than 15 people um, in our staff uh, have a positive. Actually, the number was seven um, that I got last week. So as we've started this, I believe we've only had seven of our staff members test positive for this. Again, really important that, you know, I think that's a credit to them and what they're doing. You know, we've had at least 400 people working through this working with people who we know are positive via our public safety. And um, it's a matter of really following those protocols um, and, and really wearing the mask and socially distancing when you can and moving through those systems. So, you know, thus far we're, um, you know, again, we're continuing to move through it, continuing to monitor um, what's going on, staying in contact with our colleagues. Um, the big piece that's associated with this now is really the work that we're doing on our budget, also managing our 2020 numbers. So we're doing a couple of things. We're managing 2020 and really looking at what the revenue streams look like uh, for this year's budget. And we're watching those same revenue streams to develop next year's budget. And, and, and um, so fair amount of work right now coming in on the financial side, you all will be hearing more about that in the, in the next few weeks, but, um, Again, continuing to move through it, and, and thus far I haven't really seen um, anything in the last week or so that um, is a significant change or anything that is concerning me. If you all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Susie? Um, yeah, a couple of questions. So early on, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, we were You were talking about the positivity rate in mm -hmm. Colorado and Boulder County. So at one period, I thought we were at 7%. I mean, it changed, it fluctuates so much, but where, where are we at currently? Um, for Boulder County or for the Both. state? Both. Both? Yes. Um, the state positivity rate is, as of July 27th, 2020, was 4.56%. 4.56, uh-huh. Um, And the county uh -huh. um, percentage was, I've got it on a different slide. Let me pull that up. Okay. I should have just interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 3.3%. Um, Let me show you this screen. Okay. And typically- um, If you all can see this. Is a 5% or less, is that correct? Pardon? Opening, um, you know, opening businesses, schools. Um, um, I don't know if if the states really used a, a percentage point. I know early on we were talking about that as being a threshold. If well, if you remember beginning of this, we were talking about dipping below ten percent positivity rate. Then we said we want to move below a five percent positivity rate. And as the governor was, was talking about it today, when you're about at one or 2% positivity rate, that, that is where you ideally want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and Boulder County, I just received this from Jeff today. I haven't had a chance to really look at it in depth, but if you can see the current five day average percent positive um, is 3% um, on uh, July 1st, we are at 3.3%. Okay. All right, thanks, Harold. What else? Oh, one more thing. Um, okay, Susie. What's that pool? Sorry, I we had to. It was a twofold question. He uh, <laughs> was going too fast. Um, the sunset, the pools typically mm -hmm. we close on Labor Day, but given that we are limiting the amount of opportunities for people to get out there, is there talk of ex uh, extending the closure date for the season? Um, I know that Jeff, that Jeff is looking at a number of these things. I think it changes a little bit with the way schools are opening as well, uh, because normally we, we close about that time because there's, it actually costs you more because it's, it's pretty much um, dead for a few days. But um, Jeff is looking at that, and I will follow up with him and see where he is in terms of what he's evaluating. Here comes Karen. Do you have an answer to that? Uh, yes, Karen Roney, Community Services Director. So the answer is yes, uh, Jeff and recreation staff um, are indeed 
possibly. So yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else, uh, Dr. Waters? Yeah, Harold. Um, I keep uh, kind of rolling the, the the data on testing around from week to week. Um, the the five hundred number that you mentioned tonight and that Jeff talked about, from an epidemiological standpoint, given the mm -hmm. size of our population, is a sufficient sufficiently large n, right, number of, of participants um, to determine whether or not there's community spread. That's the lower than 5%. The Correct. The 500 test tells us whether or not we're getting community spread. It doesn't really tell us anybody, it tells anything about a specific population. No. Right? Um, so if, if some subset of the population in Longmont uh, wanted to get tested, a church group, uh, uh, an athletic team, to make certain that you know that they were that, that none of them were infected. It, 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 it are all of them is or is it made stated this way? Is there anybody in Longmont who wanted to be tested, not able to get a test, or on the positive, everybody who wants one can get one? First part of the question. Second, if the if the, if the answer is yes, what's the turnaround time in terms of results? So, um, hard question. Um, so yes, there are um, the public testing sites here in Longmont. Um, I believe Salute is one that does that. I know that the hospitals are also doing that and working with, and when I mean hospitals, um, and UC Health, I believe, um, and LU8 are working with Boulder County Health. There are also private labs that are, that are doing the testing that you can pay for. Um, and so to answer the question, there are multiple venues for people to be tested. In terms of our case with our staff, what we do is we, we run them through our insurance provider um, to ensure that they can get tested. We are in daily contact with them. And so what I would say, anybody that has a business or has insurance, that's also what they need to do to ensure that. Um, and Joanne knows generally the turnaround time. So it could be anywhere from 24 hours, 24, 48 hour period to three to five days, depending on where they go. And, and so it varies by location. So it's kind of hard to say, here's the number. So if, if groups of people in, in the community, whether it's a church mm -hmm. or a, a youth sports team or an adult sports team, Correct. Um, wanted to, to, to go to, to adopt a protocol, not unlike we're seeing with pro professional sports, right? That we mm -hmm. want to make certain we're tested on a regular basis to make certain that no one in this mix is infected. Can they go to the drive-in uh, clinic or, or site? On the, those that are through the state that are free that you hear the governor talking about, um, I believe they can do that. And, um, and do you know what that turnaround time is? I don't know off the top of my head what that one is. All right. Um, okay, so that... I'll let it go. That raises new questions for me about, you know, about other decisions that get made based on testing availability and, and kind of the rigor of testing uh, regimes. Mm -hmm. What do we know about tracing? So right now, I know Boulder County has probably the most capacity in terms of tracing um, as those positives are coming into the system. Um, so early on, we were talking to, to the Jeff about providing staff if necessary. They haven't had to request that from us. Um, so they've done really well in terms of bringing that tracing capacity forward. Uh, I know that they also have IGAs with all of our surrounding counties where if any one of us got hit excessively hard, that the other county health departments could come in and support on that tracing. Um, but, you know, based on what I've heard, they're doing really they're doing well in terms of tracing capacity right so now. We're, so we're in Boulder County, we're tracing every every positive result. Uh, that's Everybody. what I'm aware of. When they come in, when they're made aware of those, they're working on the tracing component. And to give you an example, um, we actually had a situation where that occurred on one of our adult sports teams. So when it occurs in something we're doing, we're also simultaneously, we're also reaching out to the county and talking to them about this. And then they're advising us in terms of what we need to do um, in the broader sense of, of that, that 
event, whatever that event is. And so we work closely with them on the tracing piece. And my last question, I'll shut up. It, it, the, I know the, the testing center on North Main's a drive through, right? Yep. Is that also true at Salute? I don't know how Salute's doing it. Um, I can find out and get that information to you. Well, yeah, just because because that would if if it is, then you'd have to have a car to get tested, and we have a bunch of residents without cars, and and they're kind of left out of the testing opportunity if they need one. So it just would be helpful to know. Yeah, and what I can do is I'll get Joanne to put all the testing information together um, be because great. she's Thank really you. the one that does it for all all of us. Um, I learned today on something else that she said, well, if we can't do it here, I want to send this person to here or here. And this is a turnaround time. So I'll have Joanne aggregate all of that and send that to council. Very good. Thank you. That would be helpful. Thanks. All right. What else, Harold? That's all I have for today. All right. Great. Let's go ahead and... Let's move on to, there's no special reports, right? All right, let's go ahead and move on to first call public invited to be heard then. So if you are listening to this, please call 1-669-900-6833. And uh, when prompted, enter the meeting ID, 817-9591-5872. So we're gonna go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll uh, be right back, all right.
Mayor, we will uh, give our guests just another few seconds to get logged in. Looks like we're holding at eight. Mayor, we're ready when you are. Those guests that we've just let in, give us just a minute. I will be uh, identifying you individually by the last three digits of your phone number. I will call out that uh, phone number and let you know I'm unmuting you. And if you can please state your name and address for the record. You will have three minutes. Let me know, Mayor, when you're ready. All right, we're ready. We're ready. All right. The first caller I'm going to unmute. Your phone number ends in 274. I've unmuted you. Do you hear me? How, how many total do we yes, have, I Don? Can. One moment. Uh, Mayor, we have eight guests that I've let in. All right, perfect. I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and start. Thank you. So, caller, please state your name and address. You have three minutes. My name is Susan Summers. My address is 1418 Galilee Lane. Um, I'm here tonight to address some serious concerns with the prairie dog extermination permitting process. Um, recently, a landowner was caught red-handed violating our prairie dog ordinance. Um, exterminators were on site ready to exterminate without a permit when thankfully prairie dog advocate Jeremy Gregory witnessed the violation and was able to stop it. Um, discussions then kind of ensued a little bit with um, a suggestion by from advocates to amend our ordinance to allow for a 12-month hold on applying for a permit when someone has so very clearly violated this ordinance. Um, obviously, that has not happened, and so this landowner has now applied for a permit, applied for and been issued a permit a prairie dog extermination permit. Um, the application for this permit shows a very obvious attempt to stay below the 1.5 acre threshold for a major permit. Um, I emailed each council member um, with, I apologize, uh, council member Hidalgo, I did not have your email address. I did email a, an image that shows a ridiculous 68 sided polygon encompassing 1.34 acres of a 2.85 acre parcel. Um, there are very clearly open burrows just outside many of the edges of this absurd polygon. Um, and th that has been verified today by Jeremy Gregory, who will also provide more information later. Um, it, does anyone actually believe that when the exterminator arrives on this parcel, that they will follow the boundaries of this 68-sided polygon? I certainly don't think so. The exterminator will hit every borough on the 2.85 acres. Um, advocates are requesting, as allowed in the ordinance language, to have city staff review this property. Um, we are asking tonight for council to direct staff to place a hold on this permit. Um, these dogs are scheduled for extermination this Thursday, the 30th. Um, as advocates, we have all of the burden in finding relocation sites. We should not also be required to verify information submitted with an extermination application. It is very easy to see the issues with this 68-sided polygon um, within what is really a 1.77 acre active prairie dog site. Um, right, this I'm, permit I'm should gonna, never it, have been issued. Thank you um, very another much. Major we're, we're, over, we're, we're well over the three minutes, but thank you. <laughs> All right, next. Mayor, the next caller, your number is 328. I'm going to unmute you. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Chris Vosig. I live at 1609 19th Avenue here in Longmont. Um, I'm calling tonight to speak about the bike dismount ordinance as it's currently written. 
Um, I do think that there's some merit in the overall idea. However, I vehemently disagree with the fine structure that will ultimately either go unenforced or disproportionately affect our lower income residents, all in the middle of a global pandemic. Tragically, there was no real discussion on the last reading by council members or city attorney that instead of the murky assumption that, quote, the courts will figure it out, the fine should have been spelled out in a structure within the ordinance. Something more akin to a $25 first offense with increases for repeat offenders makes far more sense than a $300 maximum fine on first offense that could potentially be more than violent offenses and could very well mean the difference between contempt of court and food, medicine, or housing expenses for our poorest residents. In addition to this, the way this ordinance is being implemented is only serving to say that bikes are unwelcome in the downtown area at a time when we desperately need all of the visitors we can possibly get. While the restaurants may be doing better on the weekends due to the street closures, the retail establishments are generally bemoaning the lack of street parking during the week for less foot traffic. Please do not harm them further with a disproportionate fine that will potentially scare away the bike riders as well. If council would like to enact something far more imperative, please pass a face mask ordinance and direct LPD to actually enforce it. We seem to be currently sitting around 60 to 70% compliance, but we can and need to do better. Longmont could very well be the beacon for Colorado and enforcement from public health orders and the example for other cities as we try to beat COVID. Thank you for your time. All thank right, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Mayor, the next guest, your phone number ends in 470. You are now unmuted. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You may begin. Good. This is Hi, greetings, folks. Michael Belmont, 841 Tenacity Drive here in Longmont. I want to tackle the, the fracking issue, which is coming up a little bit later, um, it, and get, just make a couple of comments of, on which I'm extremely concerned. In February of 2018, a fracked well, it was kind of an inconsequential well or not a huge one, in Ohio had a casing failure, blew out, gushing methane for almost three weeks resulting in one of the biggest leaks in U.S. history, greater than uh, many com countries' entire year's leakage by the entire industry. Casing failures are on the rise in this industry for a number of reasons, including operators cutting more corners because of acute financial distress that's just now pervasive in the industry. But more importantly, whales are, are much longer now requiring far greater pressure and whereas four or five fractures was common in the past, as recently pointed out in the uh, Journal of Petroleum Technology, they now sometimes do 150 to 200 fractures, closely spaced together, which puts far more stress on casings than ever before. Uh, so longer wells require greater pressure to blast the fracking fluids greater distances. And since the shale industry has consistently lost money on the shorter wells, they now bet on much longer ones, which is clearly a dangerous gamble, given the, the recent history of failures. And I needn't elaborate on the dangers uh, of failed casings to groundwater and, and even uh, leakage of methane in the air, as happened in the Ohio incident. Thus, monitoring, which can be a tool pointing to these dangerous leaks, whether below or above ground, is more important than ever and accordingly, I would strongly urge the city to retain uh, Detlev Helmut to, to monitor our air quality based on his vast experience, knowledge, and expertise in this critical health air arena. And uh, I just kind of want to emphasize or, or express my fears, and as have been the fears of many citizens involved in, in the fracking issues, uh, that who's going to play, pay the cleanup costs of these spills and leaks they can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not way more. Whether it's from operators leaving incomplete work, failures of, of non-plugged, improperly plugged or very old plugged wells, operator carelessness, errors, cutting costs, inevitable accidents, technical failures, abandoned wells, passage of time uh, failures. I mean, we as taxpayers will be left holding the bag and the, the $7,600 we are paying Terracon to police Top and Cubs uh, cleanup of the recent stamp well leak is a pittance compared to what may be coming. All right, Mr. Bell, so we'll get out. I, we're, we're over three minutes, but thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. All right. All right, next. 
Our next caller is your phone number ends in 630. I have unmuted you. Can you see and hear us? I mean, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you may begin. Um, my name is Anna Rivas, and I live at 4501 Nelson Road in Longmont. And I am calling with uh, regards to that prairie dog colony that's slated to be poisoned on Thursday. Um, as Susan mentioned in, when she was speaking, the polygon that was drawn around to, in order to take to take a acreage count is just a crazy gerrymandered polygon. I mean, who does that? It looks like it was drawn by a drunk having a really hard time walking around while playing ring around the uh, prairie dog colony. Um, it's absurd, um, and it's obvious what, what the intentions were. So I am calling to request that the permit be pulled immediately until the property can be reviewed. And also, um, I wanted to mention that the signs need to be changed to make it to include the location. Um, I had seen a sign that somebody had posted to uh, Facebook, it, it, and it turns out it was that sign, but I couldn't tell where it was. and. I wasn't sure who had posted it, so I I didn't have a way of find, easily finding out where it was. I just knew it was somewhere in Longmont, so it took a little time. Uh, you know, I, I I gave the information to Susan, who was able to figure it out. But um, that information should be readily available. It shouldn't have to be something that we have to hunt down. It should be very simple to to see the sign, regardless of you know if there's an image taken of it or posted somewhere where. It, where it is, what the what the parcel uh, pertains to it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 882. I've just unmuted you. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you may begin. Uh, Mayor, uh, oh, sorry, it's Scott Conlon, 1014 Fifth Avenue. Uh, that's the Um Mayor, uh, City Council and staff, uh, Monday, Bicycle Longmont board members, uh, including myself, met with uh, City Traffic Planner uh, Phil Greenwald and LDDA Executive Director Kimberly McKee to discuss um, the proposed mandatory dismount ordinance that's on tonight's agenda for second meeting. We discussed the Bicycle Committee's uh, concerns with having a safe and a reasonable place to ride to and from downtown since we're down to one lane on Main Street and um, obviously we don't want bikes on, on the sidewalks. Um, uh, in the end, we've listened to the concerns that the LDBA had as well as the city has uh, for safety for people in town. And as we said before, Bicycle Longmont and our riders um, are for the dismount zone as long as it's one enforced correctly and two that there is a safe and reasonable place for people to ride in and out of downtown. So in the end, we came up with a compromise um, on the ordinance, which is in your agenda uh, tonight, um, proposed as uh, 10A1, and um, we outlined some several work orders, which I emailed you uh, earlier this week, um, that I'll go over at, as well. First, in the ordinance change. Um, it reflects that there is no alley um, on the east side of Main Street, um, south of 2nd, uh, where the apartments are. Um, as well, on the west side of Main, south of 3rd, there is a bus stop and there's a detour that is, uh, exists between 2nd and 1st now, which doesn't make sense to have a dismount. So we're proposing that the dismount zone is from 3rd to Long's Peak on the west side and 2nd to Long's Peak on the east side. Um, second, um, with uh, enforcement, uh, we love signs to be up, the new signs to be up as soon as possible. Um, but due to uh, the lack of rangers not starting until 2021, um, see that enforcement, uh, direct that enforcement will start um, later in 2021. This will give us space and time to educate the public and to, ta to intervene uh, with those who are riding on the sidewalk now. Which comes to the third point. So let's direct, if we could have um, City Council direct staff and LDDA to develop educational materials um, 
in terms of handouts, posters, uh, bus advertising, and that and that sort of thing uh, about the new bike route um, that it, that we went over, as well as the mandatory um, dismount zones. We would be all for that. And fourth, um, we ask that City Council direct staff and LDDA to develop um, positive signage to direct riders to the bike lanes using the alleyways and support safe crossing of the avenues mid-block with proper signage. So thanks a lot for um, all your time and effort. And I know this has been a long time coming. We've been working on this for five years as well. So thank you. Take care. Thank you. All right. How um, many more do we got to go? Two more? Uh, three more, sir. Right. Um, caller, your phone number ends in 119. I'm going to unmute you. And then the next caller after that is 332, and you can be ready. Caller 119, you're unmuted. Hi, this is Karen Dyke. I'm at 708 Hayden Court. Mr. Mayor and council members, first I want to request that Dr. Helming's contract be renewed when it comes up for renewal last next month. I use that data almost every day. I have asthma, COPD, so knowing the air quality is vital to understand whether I dare spend extensive time outdoors. Days when benzene and toluene are high mean that I can't spend much time outside. The data from Longmont monitoring is much more reliable than waiting for the ozone alert from regional data, which comes in at 4 p.m. Between the ozone and air pollution from fracking, I spend much of my day cowering in my air-conditioned home. I do worry about asthmatic children who might not have air conditioning. I, I urge you to study the information Dr. Helmut gives tonight and consider how we might make sure residents, especially those at risk of health concern, utilize this data. Second, I note that there's a brief update on the cleanup at the Stamp Well site to be given later. I urge council to follow the spill cleanup closely. Form 27, filed with the COGCC on July 10th, reveals a lot about this site. It's 700 feet from the Union Reservoir. There are domestic water wells within a quarter mile. The spill was produced water, which is a toxic byproduct of fracking and extraction operations. Top operating states that they will install monitoring wells and do additional sampling of water and soil. Soil samples taken at the site exceed the BTEX limits listed on table 910-1 in the COGCC regs. One water sample was taken. It is also listed as exceeding those limits. As an FYI, BTEX is benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. Surface water was not tested. So my question is whether Union Reservoir is contaminated. We need to make sure that adequate testing is completed. My request is that you carefully consider whether this company that potentially contaminated this wonderful water source should be allowed to drill at another site so close to the reservoir before a total cleanup of soil, groundwater, and surface water is completed. They need to clean up the mess that they currently made first. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Our next guest, your number ends in 332. You've been unmuted. Do you hear me? Guest 332, I've unmuted you. Yes. Yeah. Hello. You may begin. Hello. My name is Mitzi Nicoletti. I live at 1261 Button Rock Drive, Longmont, Colorado, 80504. And I wanted to uh, express how I'd like Dr. Hemlick's uh, testing to continue through the quality monitoring sites in Longmont. They've been extremely helpful. I have a history of bronchitis, so I do check them every day. And I'm very concerned about the air quality in our city. I'm on Union Reservoir probably four to five times a day, excuse me, a week. And then I also live maybe five minutes from Union. I've been monitoring the Stamp Well site ever since February, and I've noticed recently, if I'm going past it on my boat, that there's some type of chemical smell coming off of it, which concerns me, and I know mitigation is going on. I did witness three weeks ago when I was on my paddleboard that 
smoke and something was burning out of that site. And several people on the water were really concerned what was really happening. I noticed yesterday there's still a lot of activity out there. So my major concern, of course, as always, has been to protect that area. A lot of families use that area. People fish and eat the fish out of there. There's children um, swimming and uh, just expressing overall concern of air quality and also the contamination of water. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Our last guest, your phone number ends in 972. I've unmuted you. Could you please state your name and address for the record? You may begin. It's Jeremy Gregory here, 238 Sweet Valley Court, Longmont, Colorado. Hope everyone's doing well and staying safe and amidst madness. And uh, obviously, speaking of madness, uh, Susan and Anna has uh, shared we have a situation going on here in Mill Village where we have an individual that has already been in violation of the ordinance once before. I caught them in the act of actually poisoning me. And this explanation needs to be stopped come Thursday. Um, you guys obviously um, I would even go as far to say that this individual now needs to be given a one-year sanction due to his history. Not a town developer, he's coming in, he's now falsifying information to cut corners. Um, when you look at the crazy like, app, and it goes to show that this guy is willing to do whatever he can to save me and just get these prairie even think he has anything slated to be built there. So by the rush, why get rid of a colony? He doesn't have, to my knowledge, set to be built. Um, but last but not least, we need to have an amendment that is going to give this ordinance teeth. This is, I think, now the fourth time where an entity or an individual has come in and arrogantly and flippantly broken this ordinance and there's no enforcement. This is ridiculous. This is like spitting on the effort and energy that you all put in to drafting this ordinance. And for me, especially living in this community, it's disgusting and insulting. So I'm really hoping that you guys will Stop this extermination from happening on Thursday because we have concrete evidence that this guy is coming in and willing to have no one out or citizen advocate. And we already have a crazy lot with this pandemic of trying to stay safe and all that. So I implore you to consider putting a sanction on this guy and at least stopping this thing on Thursday so that we can get a handle on some enforcement that we've all put so much time and effort and energy into. Um, so thanks for considering. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, where I'm at. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. That's Thank exactly, you. That's exactly three minutes, Jeremy. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to the consent agenda An introduction and reading by title of first reading of ordinances. Mayor, item 9A is ordinance 2020-29, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 14.52, section 14.52.030 of the Longmont Municipal Code on compensation for disposition of open space property, public hearing and second reading scheduled for August 11th, 2020. 9B is resolution 2020-65, a resolution of the Longmont City Council authorizing the transfer of a portion of the unencumbered appropriation balance of the Employee Benefit Fund to 24 individual operating funds. 9C is Resolution 2020-66, a resolution of the Longmont City Council to approve the Colorado Communities for Climate Action 2020 Policy Statement. 8D is Resolution 2020-67, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the Intergovernmental Agreement between the City of Longmont and the U.S. Forest, Forest Service, Boulder County, and other entities for forestry health and community protection collaboration. 
9E is resolution 2020-68, a resolution of the Longmont City Council, approving the second restated and amended intergovernmental agreement between the city Boulder County and the city of Boulder for cost sharing for the COVID-19 recovery center. And 9F is approved amended council rules of procedure rule 27 regarding boards. And mayor, the only one I'm aware that staff would like to pull is F for a couple uh, clarification questions. All right, council member uh, Christensen. Pull F. Okay, we'll pull F. Um, uh, would you like to make a motion, Councilmember Christensen? All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Christensen that we pass the consent agenda except for F, and I'll second that. I lip read. All right, um, seeing no discussion, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the consent agenda minus F has passed. Um, let's move on to ordinances on second reading, specifically 10A ordinance. Uh, so we would encourage the public to call in now. Um, and so uh, we've only got one item. So if you can go ahead and uh, there we go. So uh, go ahead and call in public. If you have comment for this issue, um, go ahead and call in the public hearing. So uh, 10A Ordinance 2020-28, the bill for an ordinance amending Title 10, Chapter 10.2, creating, I'm sorry, 10.20, creating a new section, 065 of the Longmont Municipal Code, creating dismount zones. Um, so is there a staff report? I presume no. Uh, Mayor, this is Ben Ortiz, City of Longmont. Hey, Ben. Hi. Uh, well, since the first reading of the ordinance, city staff and the LDDA worked with Bicycle Longmont on a couple of changes to the ordinance mm -hmm. in order to make it a little more bicycle friendly. Hey, Susan, um, would you be willing to pull up the slide highlighting the changes, please? One minute. Thank you. So specifically, there are two changes that are being requested. And the first is the change is to actually change the dismount zone. So instead of the dismount zone being from first to long to keep, it would be different depending upon which side of the main street you're on. Uh, for the west side of main street, the dismount zone would be from third to long to keep. And on the east side of main street, it would be from second to long to keep. And this change was requested because there's no alternate route between first and second on the east side of main. And on the west side of Main Street, uh, bicyclists would like to be able to ride between 2nd and 3rd to access the regional bus stop just south of 3rd Avenue. We also added an effective date of January 1st, 2021, and this will give staff time to install bicycle routing signage and pavement markings to help bicyclists in navigating around the dismount zone. Also, since the community rangers won't be available until 2021, we can delay enforcement until then. And then the January effective date will also give staff the opportunity to do an educational campaign and advance the discount ordinance going into effect. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. All right, do we have any questions on this particular ordinance? All right, thank you very much, Mr. Ortiz. Can we have a motion from council? Mayor, I think we need to do a public uh, hearing. I guess, I guess we could. Uh, yes, we uh, just, Let's Thank go ahead you. and have the pleasure. Is everybody in the queue? No, Mayor, there is not. All right, so we'll go ahead uh, and open and then close the public <laughs> hearing ordinance. Sorry, hold on. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-28 and uh, go ahead and close the public hearing. So um, do we have any motion, a motion from council, please? Anybody want to make a motion? I will move ordinance 2020-28. I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. I'm sorry, Councilor Christensen. Yeah. First of all, I'm glad that um, Scott Conlon called in and that uh, they had the opportunity to talk to um, Mr. Ortiz and Mr. Greenwald. Um, I do think that there are a couple of things that I would personally like to see changed. I think that it's, we are conflating this with the uh, restriction of 287 right now. It's not the same thing. 
And I think that the, the dismount zone should be the same for both sides of the street or it'll be confusing to people. So I would just make it from second to Long's Peak all the way. Otherwise, I think it's very confusing. So that's number one. Number two, I do think that the, um, the fines, I think that should be codified a little bit more because when it's up to $300, I, I just think it would be good if we would put in there the first time somebody violates it, it's a warning. The second time they get a $25 fine and they may be fined up to $300. Otherwise, it's uh, we're going to get a lot of um, angry people thinking we're going to fine them $300 for not dismounting on the sidewalk. So I would offer friendly amendments to those two friendly amendments. You, you can't do a friendly amendment on on a second. On a second. You got to make a motion or or not. Okay, well, I, I, I just think this is very confusing to have it a different dismount zone on one side of the street than the other. So, Paul, Paul, what you could do is you just need to say, I move that we amend Ordinance 2020 as written as follows, and then we can discuss okay. it. Okay, I amend, I amend this amendment, or I amend this ordinance to um, make the dismount zone consistent of going from second um, to Long's Peak on both sides of the street. All right, the chair, the chair is gonna take that as a motion to amend ordinance 2020-28, um, uh, which will basically state that both sides of the street from second to Long's Peak will be dismount zones. Ben Ortiz, there's a motion, but do we have a second? I'll second that. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Christensen and seconded by Councilmember Peck. Ben Ortiz. Mayor, members of council, um, when uh, Phil and Scott Conlon had um, met with Kimberly McKee of the LBDA, it's my understanding that they were, um, the LBDA was, is pretty adamant that the dismount zone um, be maintained uh, or or be maintained in front of El Jefe's. Um, so from second to third Avenue. Um, but I think Phil could could possibly um, shed a little light on that as he was actually in that meeting. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. Um, I know Phil is, is participating in or listening in. I don't know if you'd have an opportunity to uh, shed yeah. a little light on that as well. Mayor, uh, Mayor, members of council, this is Phil Greenwald, transportation planning manager with the city. Um, I was in that meeting. I think what uh, council member Christensen is stating is that we should extend the dismount zone down to second on both sides of the street. So I think that covers Hefe's and it also, um, I think meets the intent of the LDDA. It does uh, go against a little bit of what uh, the bicycle Longmont folks were asking for, but I think we've come up with other options that can make that work. Uh, using the using the alley, basically behind Santiago's is what we call it. Um, so um, that can be used, and then also just being able to get from uh, Kaufman over to Third Main uh, on the sidewalks that way. So I think there are options. All right. So let's go ahead and vote on the ordinance. So you know, for uh, Dr. Waters. I'm sorry, not the ordinance, the amendment. Dr. Waters. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to, to go back and, and look at the original, the first version, the, the version we approved on first reading. Um, and I can't because we've got that screen up that is going to record a vote. So uh, Susan or Don, it's a little frustrating because uh, I think what Council Member Christensen is, is, is moved, it, thank you, is that we adopt the same ordinance that we adopted on first reading with the exception of the uh, implement or enforcement delayed till January 1st. Um, so I, I, for me, what we got from staff reflects the, the, those who are bicycling, the bicycle, our bicycle 
bicycling community. Um, I guess if they were if they were confused about how this would work, they wouldn't have recommended this. They're the ones that are the users, and um, to help with clarity are the are the, what the agreements that I think we heard from Phil or from Ben about delayed enforcement, sign engine, and an education effort, which is all consistent with what we got from Scott Conlon. So I guess, um, uh, you know, we approved on a first reading, we could approve, I guess, on a second reading, but but it flies in the face, of, or it's, it's basically a message to the bicycle community that, that we know more about what makes sense to them than they do, and, and I don't. So I'm not gonna vote for the motion or the, the amend, amendment because what we've heard from is the community who are using this, and I think we ought to listen to them. Casper Christensen. Um, well, what we've heard from is members who um, um, are organized who are bicyclists. Everybody, I mean, most of us ride bicycles too, and we're not part of um, Mr. Conlon's group, which I have a lot of respect for, but. I don't care whether it's second or third, as long as it's, I thought we were originally going to just have third to sixth. Now it's been extended by Longmont Downtown Development Authority to Longs Peak. And now it was extended one block south on one side of the street. And I, to me, that's not very good policy. Um, I, I would much prefer to have it just be third to uh, Longs Peak. I think we are making policy based around one business, and I don't think that's good policy. But, you know, I, I'm i just talking about the public at large is not part of the bicycle community. They just ride bicycles. And when they see a sign that says, you can ride it on this side of the street, but not the other side of the street, to me, that's confusing. But, you know, it's fine. All right, so the motion was from second to Long's Peak, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. so let's go ahead and vote. Um, all in favor of the motion again on the table is making it uh, a bike, bicycle dismount zone both sides of the street from second to Long's Peak. All right, all in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. 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 All right, the motion fails two to five with Councilmember Christensen and Councilmember Peck four and the other five against. Did I get that right? I said yay. All right, so I, Chair, would, I just couldn't tell. So the motion still fails, but fails three to four with Councilmember Martin, Count, uh, Mayor Protem Rodriguez, uh, Councilmember Waters, and Mayor Bagley uh, voting against the measure or the motion. All right, great. Thank you very much. All right, someone like to make, want to make a motion for the ordinance? I move right. approval of um, ordinance 2020-28 as presented in, in the agenda tonight. All right, I'll second that. All right, seeing no further discussions, go ahead and vote. All in favor of uh, approving ordinance 2020-28 on second reading, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, let's uh, hold on one second. Let me just fix this real quick. All right, let's go ahead and go on to item F of the consent agenda. Ah, okay. Run the meeting. Dennis. Or, yes. Hey, our mayor hey. is different. What the heck? <laughs> it says you're Brian Bagley. <laughs> Get out of the chair. All right. I was going to have him actually do F, but that was, might be inappropriate. So uh, he's taking care of Drago this weekend. So he uh, came over to go over to meet him. If you didn't recognize former Mayor Coombs, he's a great guy. All right. So let's go on to 9F. Uh, staff, you've got a, you've got a, you've actually got a presentation, right? Oh, okay. No, Mayor, I do not have a presentation. Um, we put pretty much everything in the council com. We just needed Perfect. two points of clarification. Uh -huh. One being, um, did you want to do the pre 
uh, interview screening process by to not interview applicants by a supermajority or just a majority vote. And our other question was regarding um, item L in the draft as it um, shows. The motion was to um, not interview those who had more than three absences. We just needed clarification. Is that three absences over a year, a calendar year, over their term? Um, so, we just really wanted clarification on those two things. So I believe I wanted a majority vote, but it was a super majority vote not to not to interview somebody. Am I right on that one, guys? I think so. Right. So we already voted on that one. And then as far and, and as far as clarity on missing three, um, I believe it was during their term, was it not? Um, it was your it was your motion, Councilmember Christensen. What was it? No. It was Councilwoman Peck's. All right, Councilwoman Peck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. It was during a uh, during a year, one year, three during one year? absences within a year. And would right. that be within the previous twelve months year, or the or the current calendar year? Just to be exactly clear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think from when their term started, because they don't always yeah. start uh, at the same time. They're so, stacking would be at the, the time that they're appointed. So basically the previous 12 months starting previous the time 12 they months. start previous 12 months. Does everyone else, does anyone object? Did everyone remember that correctly? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a consensus vote just in case it's not. So do you have your clarification, Don? Uh, I do, but it looks like Council Member Christensen oh, has Councilmember, a question. Council Member Christensen, go ahead. Yeah, that is. Um, that's why I pulled it. Can you hear me? I think yep. so. Okay, um, that's why I pulled it. I wanted to clarify that because it wasn't clarified, and it it could have been used as a term, which you know sometimes it's four years. So you know, three unexcused absences in uh, four years is not really terrible. But you know, you should be able to make at least three fourths of the meetings in a year if you're uh, serious so agreed okay. all right great thank you do you want to make a motion councilor christensen since you pulled it um i move that we amend that to clarify that it is three unexcused absences within a the previous year the previous year yes second it, all right all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. opposed say nay all right, motion carries unanimously. You want to make another motion, Council Member Christensen? Mayor, if I could interject. Right. Go ahead, Eugene. Uh, Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, my concern with the supermajority vote on whether or not to interview a candidate is that the charter provides that council shall act only by ordinance, resolution, or motion. And for resolutions and motions, the charter provides it shall require the affirmative vote of a majority of the members present. And so a supermajority would appear to conflict with the charter uh, direction that council votes uh, by affirmative majority. Okay, mm. so uh, I'd actually move that we amend it to say the majority. Councilor Waters? Second. Right, it's been moved and seconded, but Councilor Waters? So it's just explain to me how, how it plays out. Um, uh, the we, would, we would have a vote I guess after reviewing applicants applications, uh, we would we would cast a vote in a in a meeting to not invite someone for an interview, for whatever reasons are are are, are articulated at the time. Is that is that how this would work? I, I would I would imagine I would imagine so. Like for example, let's suppose that we've got Catherine Fink, Fink Johnson who's done an outstanding job, you know, and we want to appoint her. Uh, maybe we don't want to interview her. Um, maybe there's. Um, well, just wait. Just wait for a moment. Yeah. In that case, it would seem to me we would vote not to interview all the other applicants for that board. Correct. Mayor, if I could, just interject quickly. Go ahead. Um, the way we would envision that working, Mayor and Councilmember Waters, would be the way that we did that this last time via the pre-interview screening process, whereby we sent you all a sheet and then you indicated which ones, which applicants you did not want to interview when there was four or more, then we did not call that person in 
we would not call that person in for interview if you went with a majority vote. Well, that's that's pretty easy, it seems to me, when you have more candidate, you have more openings than you have candidates. Correct. Right. In in that case, on that for that spreadsheet, my personally, I indicated I didn't need to interview these people because it's a no-brainer. You had more openings or the same number of openings as applicants, just appoint them. Uh, but when you have more applicants than openings, um, it feels it's a, it, it's I'm not comfortable, frankly, with uh, with expressing ourselves the way we did prior to this interview. That feels like a black ball, uh, uh, you know, without being public about it. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that, frankly. I'm not gonna participate in that process. I'll just remain silent if that's what the way it's gonna work. Because I'm not gonna blackball or prohibit somebody from being interviewed when we have more candidates than openings in the way that we went about this last this last process, frankly. I guess I guess in my I guess in my mind, there's just so many times when uh, I mean half the interviews we do, we don't need to have them. Um, just because we either know them or they've served on the board before. Um, it's just a, it's a five to six minute interview. Most of the information we're gleaning is off their written application. And uh, I, I wouldn't mind, I just want to wait to just, you know, if we choose not to interview somebody, in my mind, it's been because why do we need to interview this person? We're going to appoint him or her. So why, why uh, mess around with it? So Councilmember Christensen? Polly, you're, you're muted, Polly. Okay, um, I agree with Dr. Waters. I, I really do think that we should be interviewing any, everyone and I, except for people who have been serving, but see this time, um, for instance, we have Susie, she's new. She doesn't necessarily know people. I, I just, I think it's disrespectful and I think it leads to kind of a favoritism thing going on and the only reason I would not want to interview someone is if they have a clear conflict of interest and they've even stated it. And that's the only reason I would not want to interview anybody. And I also disagree with the idea of just, if we've only got two candidates and two openings, we just automatically appoint them without even talking to them. That's not a very good idea either in my point of view, because you can get some really bad people that way just because nobody else applied. So um, I, I I don't see why we would not interview anybody except if they have already served and all of us have already met them, but that's rarely the case. All right, let's go ahead and vote. Okay, sorry, Councilor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, my reasoning is that not every board or commission meets every month. Some of them are uh, uh, every two months, every six weeks. Um, and if they if they're not if they're not meeting every month and they have three unexcused absences and don't bother to tell anybody why, then are they really going to the meetings? I mean, are they really a good applicant to be on this board? Um, right, right. And that was my reasoning is that um, it doesn't really matter to me whether they're there or not unless they're uh, unless they really have an excuse. It, it would be like uh, one of us just not showing up two or three times without telling anybody why. These boards to me are very important. And um, that was my reasoning. But if but if a majority of us don't want it, that's fine. Right, but we're talking about, we're, we're at this point, we're, anyway, Councilmember Martin. Well, I was just going to agree with Joan. I think that if a person has uh, unexcused absences uh, and that's on the report, then we could say we're not going to interview this person. Um, what I definitely don't want to do is what we almost did with Catherine Fink Johnson, which was not interview her because we all knew her. Um, but she did, wouldn't have gotten a chance to defend her seat against more applicants than there were seats. Um, so that uh, we definitely cannot do. Um, but, um, uh, and the, the other thing is about the, the same number of applicants or fewer than we have seats. 
It matters in some cases and not the others. You know, if it's Master Board of Appeals, we have to talk to them no matter what. I'm going and- I'm, I'm to go ahead and withdraw my motion. Therefore, there's no more motion on the table. Does anyone else want to make a motion that would, uh, Dr. Waters? Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, I just want to point out, my concern isn't with uh, Councilmember Peck with uh, the absentee issue. I, I agree with that. If, uh, I mean, that, but that's a clear criteria for somebody not being eligible. I'm, I'm talking more about the motion uh, in the list. It's the motion uh, made by Councilmember Rodriguez, seconded by Councilmember Martin, uh, to, to prohibit, to, to choose not to interview somebody without a specified criteria. Um, uh, and that was the one relative to a super majority. Uh, I, voted, I, I voted against that when we were talking about it. And if that stays in here, I'm gonna vote against that. So uh, I'm gonna move that we delete that section entirely from this list of criteria. So I move that we, we delete from this set of uh, uh, procedures or guidelines, whatever this is, um, the agreement that was made during our Saturday discussion uh, about um, choosing not to interview, whether it's a majority vote or a, a super majority, people who have applied for a border commission when we have more candidates than we have seats. All right, all in favor? Oh, sorry. Oh, all in favor, say aye. I'm sorry, Mayor. Who seconded that? I apologize. The Councilor Christensen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Is that a yes vote from your dog? Yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. Petey says that that's the way it's going to be. So all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Now, I'll, now I'm happy to move the rest of the guidelines. All right, I'll second, second. that. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, great. Okay, let's move on to, we all doing okay? We wanna rock through these last things, it's only 8.30. Wanna take five, are you guys okay? All right, let's go on to the regional air quality monitoring presentation, oil and gas update, please. Shall I take it away? Good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. My name's Jane Turner and I'm the city's oil and gas and air quality coordinator. I'm new, this is a new position. I just started in April and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to present to council. I've spoken with a few of you over email, but um, it's nice to be able to have this opportunity to introduce myself to you as well as to Longmont residents. I'm a certified professional engineer and I have a PhD in air quality engineering from CU Boulder. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to work with a city that's being so proactive about environmental monitoring and showing such an interest in air quality research. So you can bring up the slides now. And I think I've introduced myself, so we can go to slide two. I'm gonna be providing a brief update on some oil and gas activities, and that'll be followed by a presentation on the city's regional air quality monitoring by Dr. Detlev Helmig of Boulder air Atmospheric Innovation Research. Slide three. The first update is regarding production activities at the Stamp Well. The Stamp Well is an oil and gas well that's located on the northwest side of Union Reservoir. And some residents have expressed concerns about some of the production activities that have occurred, particularly between July 2019 and March 2020. During that time period, a workover rig was observed at the site. And the residents have expressed some concerns about whether any of these activities have been in violation of the city's agreement with Cub Creek Energy. As you're aware, the city has entered into an agreement with Cup Creek Energy. It covers a number of oil and gas wells, including the Stamp Well, and it prohibits certain activities, including hydraulic fracturing. Staffs reviewed the activities that occurred during this time frame. We've reached out to our contacts at the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, the COGCC, 
because they regulate the activities at this site. And we've also spoken with our special oil and gas legal counsel, Phil Barber. Based on these reviews, it's the current understanding and belief of the city staff that the activities were in accordance with state regulations and that none of these activities have specifically violated the city's agreement with Cub Creek. Next slide. The next update is also on the stamp well and it's regarding ongoing remediation activities there. This remediation is a separate topic and not related to the production activities I was discussing on the last slide. The remediation is happening because there was a spill, a leak of some fluids at the site, and that was identified on May 14th of this year. Workers at the site found that the source of the leak was a crack in a fiberglass tank. This was a large holding tank, 100 barrels. It was stored above ground and it was holding produced water. So that's water that has come back up out of the well. In response to this, COGCC has directed them to do a site investigation. And that means that they take soil samples to determine where any impacts from the leak are. And then they dig that soil out, remove it from the site, take it to be properly disposed. The pit that's left behind is then filled in with clean soil. And that backfilling process started on July 1st and my understanding is that it's complete. The next step in the process is that COGCC will require a follow-up report that's gonna be due on August 7th. The report will be posted on the COGCC website. It'll be publicly available and it'll include more information about the total soil removed from the site, the samples, as well as uh, plans for a groundwater monitoring system. So right now there are three groundwater monitoring wells out at the site. As part of the city's program, we test those monitoring wells every year. COGCC is gonna ask them to put in additional monitoring wells to make sure that if there are groundwater impacts, those are well understood and remediated if needed. There is right now no ongoing leak at the site. The tank that was cracked has been removed. There's no threat to residents that we're aware of. And regarding the Cub Creek Agreement, the accidental spill at the site is also not in violation of that agreement. The last update I have for you is not about the stamp well, it's about the night wells. And these are oil and gas wells which are planned to be drilled in 2020 outside the city properties to the north. The night well pad is located directly north of Union Reservoir, but south of Highway 66. Now the night wells are still in the planning stages, but what is happening is that we have received construction plans for an access road that will allow the operators to get to that well pad. Those plans are currently being reviewed by city staff in the development and review group. And it's our understanding that Cub Creek intends to begin construction of that road as soon as those plans are approved in order to keep them on uh, their planned timeline of beginning drilling the night wells in September of this year. So if we, unless we have questions, I'll turn it over to our main event. Council Member Peck. Thank you, Jane. Can you tell me uh, how much soil um, it, it was excavated that had been leaked, that the uh, groundwater leaked? I don't have the number right now. The engineers are working on those, uh, getting the estimate to be accurate. I did reach out to Cub Creek and they prefer to um, include that information in the upcoming report to COGCC and didn't want to provide something that was inaccurate because they're not quite done with the calculations. Okay, thank you. Is there going to be any surface uh, water testing to see if any of that groundwater has actually leaked into our Union Reservoir? Well, as you know, uh, the city of Longmont has a Union Reservoir baseline monitoring study that we do, and uh, we just collected a sample there the last week of June, and there were no oil and gas compounds detected in our three Union Reservoir surface water samples, so that's certainly a good sign. And what do you sample for? Are they for VOCs? VOCs, BTEX, um, let's see, diesel range, organics, a number of different oil and gas related compounds. Okay, thank you. And the tank that has been removed, was the uh, water still in the tank when it was removed or did, did you, was the water taken out of that tank? 
I believe the first thing they did was to drain the tank and to take that water off site before they removed the tank. Okay, so it was drained into a tanker and driven out away. It wasn't put in a pool or... I can't say exactly how that water was removed, but there are certainly are regulations that um, cover how the, they certainly can't put it into the ground. Um, they have additional tanks that can be used at the site as well. Okay, I would be curious as to what they did with that water. So okay, I'll be happy to follow up on that. That would be great, thank you. I think uh, Dr. Waters was next. You do that so much more politely than the mayor does. Am I even supposed to be calling on you? I don't think so, but <laughs> that's really what the mayor does. But he's go nuts, Dr. Turner, go nuts. You got a PhD, you're smarter than me, go. Uh, you know, when council, member do, council members do that to him, it's, I, I, I find the humor in that as well. So anyway, uh, uh, Jane, you may or may not be able to answer this, but I, I do recall that on the stamp well, uh, with the agreement we signed, one of the contingencies was that the, the uh, gathering line or flow line that went from the stamp well, you know, south and then east again, um, would be uh, would be severed, purged, um, uh, and sealed once the night site was productive, and that got accelerated, right? Cub Creek or whoever, I guess it was Cub Creek, uh, did that a year ago, which for which we're grateful and um, was a, a win, I think, for all of us. But I don't recall when the night well becomes productive. Are there other implications for the stamp well? Because I have in my mind that the stamp well would then be shut down, abandoned. And, but I don't, maybe I just made that up. Do you, do you remember? I, Dale, I'm certain, would know. Yeah, that's my understanding, but I think Dale would be a better person to answer this one. And uh, Councilmember Waters, could you uh, repeat that for me? I have a, a cat in front of me here. Got you napping, Dale. Uh, a cat nap. <laughs> Um, Dale, I, the, um, is my recollection that in the agreement we signed that once the, in this kind of is the connection between the, the night uh, property access road and the stamp well, that when the, when the night property starts producing, that the stamp well is abandoned or plugged. Is, is that, do I recall that properly? That is, that is it's uh, Council Member Waters, it's within a certain number of days of production of a well at the night site that then days. the well is to be affirmatively plugged and abandoned. So you're, you're correct, but it's tied to production yeah, yeah, uh, commencing yeah. at a well at the night site. All right, thanks. I, that was just, I appreciate it. Council Member Waters, it's 90 days within commencement of production to abandon the stamp well. All right, good. Thank you, Dave, uh, Eugene. Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I'm uh, uh, wondering the, what the point is of the commencement of the road construction being mentioned. Is this uh, something new that was not uh, in the original agreement about the night well, or um, we have easements in place and everything? It is, uh, Council Member Water, uh, um, Martin, it is, um, it Uh oh, he's frozen. Dr. Turner. Back God, up, man. God has smitten him for not following procedure. So I this think is all staff is. Plans. Oh, are you back, Dale? We missed you, Dale. You froze. <coughs> Let me try to answer it again. Uh, Councilmember Martin, the construction of the access road to the night site was a condition included in the top Cub Creek City Agreement from 2018. All staff is wanting to do is to keep council informed of additional uh, work uh, as, as uh, Cub Creek progresses towards um, the drilling of wells at the night site. So it's nothing new. Uh, it's going through the process as we anticipated it would. And um, I, I believe the staff is doing the right thing to uh, appropriately review the design of the road 
to ensure that it's uh, done appropriately. Thank you very much. That's comforting. Councilor Peck. Thank you. Just you're muted, Joan. Okay, thanks. Um, so, Dale, uh, the access road to the stamp well, does it is it also in line to the night well? I mean, I'm wondering, um, it is not it's a total different location. Okay. No, uh, very different locations, correct. Okay, thanks. All right, Dr. Turner, why don't we go on with whatever's next? Okay, uh, just one more slide, an introduction slide. That's slide five of my one, presentation. One moment. Okay. Thank you. So now for the main event, we'll be hearing a presentation by Dr. Helmig on the city's air quality monitoring study. You'll recall that in 2019, the city contracted Boulder Air to conduct a study of Longmont's air quality. And the study includes two monitoring sites and each has a special focus. In the photo on the left, you see the airport monitoring site on the west side of town. And that was designed to gather data to help the city meet the greenhouse gas emission goals outlined in the city's sustainability plan. In the photo on the right, you see the Union Reservoir Monitoring Site, which is located nearer to oil and gas activities, which are predominantly located in Weld County. The Union Reservoir Site includes specialized air monitors with the goal of identifying oil and gas air impacts to the local air quality. So Mayor Bagley and City Council, we've asked Dr. Helmick to prepare a 30 minute presentation summarizing his findings so far. And that presentation will be followed by time for questions. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Helmick now. Yes, hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me here on the call. Um, so I think I need Susan's help now with pulling that presentation up. Okay, there we are. Good. So um, those are the points I want to walk you through today. Um, real quick, um, objectives of the study. Again, then the station development, the websites that were created. And then um, most of the time will be dedicated towards showing you some of the data that we've been gathering. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, um, Dr. Turner already nicely summarized this. There's several objectives um, covered by this program. So the first one is um, to monitor greenhouse gases um, released from the footprint of the city with a goal to assess the city's path towards um, sustainability. Um, the second point was to monitor primary oil and gas emissions. And then to provide these data and interpretations to the public and as well um, to the research community, industry partners, um, and so forth. Um, the next slide, please. And we are monitoring quite an array of different atmospheric um, variables. Uh, most of these are, are atmospheric gases, and I've listed them here again. So these include carbon dioxide, methane, a whole series of volatile organic compounds, so abbreviated as VOCs, um, and we'll see several of those further down. Then we're monitoring nitrogen oxides, we're monitoring ozone, also particulate matter or aerosols, and then meteorological variables. And then the sites also have webcams. And all of these measurements are conducted automated, continuous, and year round at um, very high time resolutions, so minute to one hour time resolutions. Uh, next slide, please. This is an um, overview of the timetable of the progress we've made. Um, the first phase was identifying sites, designing the website, um, identifying the type of buildings and structures we needed. Uh, it took quite a while for the buildings to go into place and then um, 
be um, provided with power and internet. Um, then the first location the at the, the airport became available for us to move in in September. And we pretty much got um, everything up and running within a few weeks. And ever since um, the systems have been producing data. The second site um, at the Union Reservoir, um, the building became available in December. It took us about six weeks to get all systems up and running. And ever since both um, sites have been reporting data um, continuously. Next slide, please. Again, this is um, where the sites are located, and I need to familiarize you with the abbreviations we're using here. LMA stands for Longmont Municipal Airport. You'll see that down in the presentations a lot. And that site is located on the, this, the southeast corner of the airport where this asterisk there is. Oh yeah, thank you for pointing this out. So it's been the fenced area of the airport, and I, I, it's turned out to be a really nice, nice location. Um, we like that it's, it's it's nicely protected and guarded. Um, and the next slide then I think shows um, again the, the the infrastructure. It's it's a trailer and a measurement tower right next to that. You saw that already. The tower accommodates uh, meteorological sensors, inlets for the gas measurements, and then on the left you see the instrumentations inside the shelter, which in this case are monitors for ozone, methane carbon dioxides, and then computers, communication systems, data logging, and so forth. Next slide, please. And moving on to the Union Reservoir. So we're right there where there's that star is put on the map. It's within the park area. And again, what's nice, it's a gated area. So um, um, the, 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 the park staff are keeping an eye on it. So it's in the southwest corner of the um, Union Reservoir. And here the abbreviation we're using is LUR for Longmont Union Reservoir. Next slide, please. And again, that shows the, the building itself. So this is a hard permanent structure put in place, again, with a tower right next to it. Um, and on the right side, you can see the reservoir in the background. This gives you an idea about the distance to the water edge, which is about uh, 20, 30 meters or something like that. Next slide. Um, there's a much higher number of instruments in this um, facility, since we're doing far more measurements here. Um, aerosols are being sampled so on the left side that shows the aerosol equipment. That's a sampling stack that goes th straight through the roof of the building. And then again, a tower with meteorological sensors, gas inlets. Um, and then the, the, the center picture shows the instrumentation. And here we're monitoring ozone, nitrogen oxides, VOCs, methane, CO2, and again, equipment for communication, data logging, and so forth. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, those two sites um, here with a double red um, circle, um, those are the two Longmont sites. And what I'd like to point out is that um, this is actually now part of a regional network. And what makes this, this really valuable and, and what adds um, high value is that we have these comparison opportunities since we're doing um, simultaneous monitoring now in uh, two sites in Broomfield, as well as the um, Boda Reservoir, it's in the up, upper left corner. And um, we've learned a lot about um, what's happening in Longmont by comparing these observations. And I'll show you a lot of these type of comparisons. And it's also, of course, nice, this is all now in, under one roof. So this, this allows us to do this with very consistent mm -hmm. um, measurements um, for these comparisons. Next slide, please. And then we designed websites, and some of you may have seen this by now. Um, this is the site dedicated for the um, Longmont um, air quality observations, and it has seven tabs that you can see at the top. There are the, the webcam images from the two sites. They're updated every 30 minutes. Then there are tables that show the meteorological data, the current data, the past eight hours, the, the maximum of the last over the last 24 hours. Then there are tables that report the chemical measurements. Um, and then at the bottom is the same for the Union Reservoir. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, besides that site, we also, um, just over the last month, generated an, a, a sister site, so to speak, that then 
provides these observations from all these other sites that I just showed on the map um, side by side in one set of graphs. Um, so this shows the methane, the ozone, and nitric oxide data. There's, there's ways more of these plots on the same website, but you can see with the color traces then how the data from the Longmont side, so that's LMA and LUR, compared to the observations um, being made at the same time in these other locations, um, which you know gives you an idea how you um, experience high levels, low levels, average levels, and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, so we are we're currently managing websites from these three different monitoring programs in Longmont, in Broomfield, and at Boulder County. And um, they're all um, shown here just with some screenshots. And what I'm listing here also are the visits and the site visits where we have counters, visit counters on these sites. And what I find remarkable is that actually right now Longmont has taken the first place. Um, it's the busiest site, gets the most visits of all these other sites. I mean, they're all pretty busy and being being well recognized. Um, but just over the last two months, we've gotten um, 2,000 visits on the Longmont sites, so about 1,000 thousand a month, 30 a day, roughly like that on average. The next one, please. And then we just generated this, this site, um, which is a data analysis tool. Um, and this is just a screenshot to give you an idea what you can do here. You can select in the left panel the sites that you want to um, investigate and then on the right side you can select the the variable that you want to plot then you have a time window um, you can select the start date and the end date and then just click go and then it will generate graphs with um, these data um, all plotted together and in the following I will now show you many many graphs that were generated with this this tool so let's move forward to the next slide okay so let me walk you now through some of the data examples, um, data we've gathered so far. And I'll want to start out with ozone. Again, ozone um, is of quite some concern in this region since we are, since we're in a non-attainment um, area for for the ambient ozone standard. And it's a secondary pollutant. So again, it's not emitted directly, but it's formed in the atmosphere during the day um, and you need sunlight for that, it's a photochemical reaction um, with atmospheric precursors of nitrogen oxides and VOCs. And given the dependence on lights, you get more of that in the summer when you have more light and longer days. Um, ozone is a strong oxidant and it impacts your respiratory system. So elderly children, people with respiratory um, illnesses are, are even more so affected than the average person. In the bottom, you can see um, data from February through just a few days ago, um, ozone from the two monitoring sites here in Longmont. And you can see we've, we've exceeded the um, this ambient national air quality standard on quite a number of occasions. And I will um, explain that a little bit more. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is now zooming into one of these um, records. This is three days of ozone data. And again, what you see here are the data from the four sites that currently report ozone. Um, and you can see it goes up and down, up and down every day. Um, the lows are at night, the highs are in the early afternoon. And um, again, the dotted line is the standard. And just a few days ago on the 21st, you can see that ozone at all of these sites exceeded the standard. And you see how similar ozone behaves at these different sites. So ozone, it's a regional pollutant. It takes a while for it to build up. Air moves around during the time. So it's not like, you know, you have a certain neighborhood or a street corner where there's much more ozone than um, a block away. It's a regional pro pollutant and we, we all um, experience very similar levels here. However, on average, um, um, the highest level we've seen so far at the Boulder Reservoir and at the um, Longmont Airport, you can see that here um, as well. That's where the, the ozone peaked on the, on the 21st. So let's keep going to the next slide. Um, 
What's important to understand is that the health standard is defined as the eight hour moving average. So when you get ozone readings that pop above the 70 ppb threshold, it doesn't mean that you violate the standard because this, this event may be rather short. So in the top mm -hmm. graph, you see these spikes that go over the, the dotted line, which is the standard. Um, and then the, the smoother line and it's en enlarged in the bottom graph, that's the eight hour average standard. It's the eight hour moving mm -hmm. standard. And you can see that during this time window in June, there were two days where the standard was actually exceeded. So this is a real exceedance of the standard. Um, whereas, you know, you may have short term um, spikes over the line that would not be um, considered an exceedance of the standard. But still, we put this line in the graphs to give you an anchor point um, where the standard is in relation to the current ozone level. Next slide, please. Um, I want to also um, show you a very interesting, <laughs> interesting situation we had to, to help you understand what's driving ozone in this region. Um, so this was in um, well, just a couple of weeks ago, early July, um, three days of data and you see ozone goes up, goes down, goes up, but why? what's happening on the 10th? What happened on the 10th? Ozone goes up as usual during the morning and then wang, it took a nose dive right around noon, bottomed out, you know, and it was heading way high to exceed the standard that day, but then it collapsed. So um, let's take the next slide. Um, and that shows you nicely the value of just the meteorological observations. What I have here now in the second and third graph are the wind speed and the wind direction measurement from that same period. And that blue line then shows you what happened during this episode when ozone um, dropped. You can see what happened. Well, it got really windy. The winds, you know, they were pretty mild, moderate, one, two meters per second. That's the second graph. And then, whoa, right around noon, winds got really, really strong. And now look at the bottom graph. The winds shifted. They shifted from in the morning, so it was easterly winds. And very abruptly, they shifted to the west. And then they flip back to the east, right? Yes, thanks for the cursor help. Perfect, yes. So, you know, this this is actually really interesting because, you know, we, we, we sometimes hear opinions out there stating that, you know, ozone is due to background, or high ozone background and ozone moving in from outside of the state, you know, as, but you can see here as the winds move west, um, transport comes straight over the mountain, um, you know, ozone drops down to 50, 55, you know, we're in a much cleaner ozone environment. And then ozone shift back to the east, you get flow from east of the city, and bang, it goes way up again, and it exceeds the standard on that day. That shows you how sensitive our ozone conditions are to the transport conditions at any particular time of day. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so ozone summary, what have you learned about ozone? So ozone is monitored at both um, the airport and the reservoir. So far this season, we had had four days with exceedance of the national ambient ozone air quality standard. Um, the exceedances at the airport have been slightly higher than at the, res at the um, Union Reservoir. And most times there's higher ozone in easterly winds than in westerly transport. So let's move on to the next species, and that's um, methane. This shows um, the methane results. And so again, methane, what's the deal with methane? So methane is a very strong climate gas. It's the, the second strongest um, warming force um, um, causing global warming. And it has quite a variety of sources. Um, they're, they're in, uh, indicated in these pictures up there. So in the region here where we are, it appears that you know oil and gas is really the, the, the dominant sources, dominant source, contributing source for methane. At the bottom now you see the graph of the methane data and it shows methane for the reservoir, for the airport, also in Boulder. And then um, later this spring, ozone came on light in Broomfield and that's the green data. So it can see it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, lots and lots of spikes. And you see a lot, a lot of purple and purple is um, the purple spike are so higher than what the spikes we see at the airport and what we see at the, um, the reservoir. And um, 
if you go to the next slide, I think I have that blown up there. Yeah, yeah. So there you see um, now uh, maybe some 20 days or so. And you see, you know, it's it's the bottom of the data is always the same even because there's a background in methane that's very uniform across the globe. But then on top of that background, you see these spikes and they're very short. You know, they're just a few minutes, um, half an hour or something. And you can see most of the spikes are in purple. So at the Union Reservoir, we see a far higher frequency and higher resulting concentrations in methane than at any of the other sites. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a comparison of the six months of data um, between the Boda Reservoir, the airport, and the um, Union Reservoir. Um, and um, you can see the green box whisker plots where the, the middle line is the median, the box is from 25 to 75 percentile, and the, the top of that that whisker, that's the 95 percentile. So you can see every month of, of that period, um, Union Reservoir had the highest methane, both in the median, both in the extreme values. Um, the Longmont Airport was in between, and the Boda Reservoir, the Blue Data, had the lowest methane overall. And um, the next slide, you know, shows the, the likely explanation for that. Um, which is the proximity to the oil and gas development. So all these dots and there on the map, oil and gas wells, and you can see the Union Reservoir is the closest, um, the airport possibly the second closest, and the Boda Reservoir is about the furthest away. And that nicely correlates with these um, distribution in the methane data we are seeing. So next slide, please. Um, to show you how dynamic this can be, it's a really interesting event. And this actually has been the highest methane spike we've, we've ever seen, both in three years at the Boda Reservoir, um, three months in, in Broomfield so far. And this occurred on March 26th. And within just a few minutes, methane went up from the, the about two ppm background values all the way to 32 ppm, so 15 times as high. And you can see this just lasted 15 minutes and then it came down again and it was pretty much normal. So the spike where it went up just like like crazy, um, very short, short event. So what happened? Um, let's look at some other variables that were measured. Thank you. Um, so the bottom two graphs now show the wind direction and the wind speed during that same time window. And you see these, these dotted lines. Um, show this, this this time window. So the wind direction from that, the average across that 15 minutes was 33.5 degrees. Wind speed, two meters per second, which is, you know, it's, it's moderate, but you can really define a pretty well, uh, pretty well the wind direction and a transport. So, um, so wind direction 335 degrees. Let's look at the next slide. Um, that puts that now on the map. So the, the star shows where the, the measurement station is, the monitoring station, and the fat arrow in the middle is the 335 degree window. And then I'll put like 15 degrees uncertainty windows on both sides. So that's roughly, you know, where this, the sector from which this methane plume was transported to the Union Reservoir. And then the circle, gives you, you know, how far the transport approximately is within a five minutes um, transport period, given the two meters per second wind speed we had. Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, then we have these data analyzed um, as wind sectors on the left, this shows um, the wind roses and on top of the wind roses, the colors show, you know, high the methane is depending on if the wind comes from one direction versus the other. We can also do these heat maps on the right side. So let's just look at the one on the top for the Union Reservoir. So imagine yourself, the station is right in the center of that cross. And you can see that most of the methane, the, the redder colors, um, occur from winds to the north, slightly to the northwest, and a lot from the northeast sector. But there's much lower methane when air comes over the city to the south, um, west, and um, further away, or at, at higher winds from the south, um, from the northwest sector as well.
So let's go to the next um, slide. So that's the summary on methane. So we're collecting very fast data, five seconds, high resolution data at both sites. We're seeing a high abundance of spikes. They're often very short in durations. Um, the mean, the median and variability are highest at the reservoir. And the elevated concentrations are mostly associated when winds are from the north and from e with easterly winds. So that's the methane summary, and let's move on to the VOCs. Um, so the VOCs, we started monitoring at the reservoir in um, mid-February. So this, this graph here, it shows in blue the data from the um, Buddha Reservoir that had been ongoing for two, three years. And then we turned our instruments on at the reservoir and said, wow, what's going on here? We were, we were really surprised. Um, because the levels we were seeing in February, March at the reservoir were, um, as you can tell here, significantly higher than what we've ever seen at the Boda Reservoir before. And so the compound we're looking at here, ethane, is um, our favorite oil and gas tracer. Um, because there's really no other significant sources for ethane. Um, so you can see, you know, ethane was, was, was really high, lots of spikes, uh, much, much higher than what we see at the Boda Reservoir. And I think the next slide um, enlarges this. Yeah, so again, the time frame for this, very interesting observation. I would say, you know, it's one of the most beautiful <laughs> data sets I've ever um, um, collected in my career because there's such a stark change, such a stark difference. In, in February and March, we see these spikes with 200, 300, 400, 500 parts per billion of ethane. And then as you can see, as the season progressed, um, it became less and less and less. And the last part of this record, it's really low. It's about, you know, as much as at the other side. So what's happened? Well, several things happened during this window. Um, we, um, we started slowing down with lots of our activities on right around March 12th. Um, when the COVID restriction came in place. On March 20th, we started um, putting this data on the website and everybody out there could see, look, you know, here's, here's methane and other VOCs being monitored at the Union Reservoir. Um, on April 13th, there were articles in the local paper um, reporting about this air monitoring. And then in April 20th, um, you know, the, the oil prices took a nosedive actually into the negatives, which um, slowed down production um, activities. Um, so let's go to the next slide um, that again compares, you know, this, this, this whole window. And I've now added the very, very latest data. Um, and it actually makes you almost su suggest that maybe um, after a period of two, three months where it was quite moderate, um, the levels are picking up again, possibly. Um, so that was ethane. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so another VOC I want to bring up is benzene. Benzene receives a lot of attention because it's one of the VOCs that's recognized as a, as a toxic compound as a, and as a carcinogen. And I'm listing here for reference um, health thresholds that are set by different agencies. So there's nine PPB standard for 24 hour exposure, one PPB uh, for long term. Um, the World Health Organization um, claims there's no really safe limit for benzene. So let's um, keep those values in mind when we look at some data that be on the next slide. Um, but before that, I also um, want to remind you, there was a lot of, yeah, the next slide, please. Um, there was a lot of attention, a lot of interest paid to benzene um, just a few months ago because there you know, have been observations of elevated benzene in the region um, just a little bit northeast from Flangmont. Um, these measurements done by CDPHE um, where a one 45 minute measurement of 10.2 ppb was reported. Later that was revised to um, 14.7 ppb. So that's kind of the scale now to compare our data from the reservoir. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so this shows the benzene from the Union Reservoir. And, you know, it looks similar to ethane. In February and March, there was a lot happening. There was a lot going on. Um, benzene spikes, many of them in the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight PPB range. 
and then come April, May, it slowed down a lot. And, you know, towards the later part now, um, it looks very similar to what we observe at the um, Boda Reservoir and in Broomfield. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I think that compares that again on top. And these are into, zoomed to the same scale, top the benzene data from the reservoir, Union Reservoir um, in purple in, in February and the bottom in May, um, again, compared to Boda Reservoir and Broomfield side. Um, the next slide, please. And this is the very latest, just the last few days, weeks. And you can see, you know, it's, it's leveled down where now the benzene is very similar to what we see at the other locations. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so where is this basin coming from? Where's the benzene coming from? Where, where was it coming from um, in the earlier part of the record? So the four graphs here on the left, they show the benzene measurements. These are four hours of data. It shows actually three measurements we have. These were taken every two hours. These, these blue, the green dots. So first it was low, then it jumped up to that's the highest value, 8.5 or something. And then two hours later, it came down to two. And on the next graph to the right shows the methane plotted together with it, which we can measure at my high, much higher time resolution. And you can see the benzene peak coincided right when there was a spike in methane. So right together in the same. And then we did again what I showed earlier. We um, looked at the wind direction and the wind speed. And then the, the, the map on the right side shows where that spike roughly originated from in terms of wind direction. Um, you know, so this came from the, the Northwestern sector. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And that now does the same exercise for the 10 highest benzene peaks we observed so far. Um, so, you know, you can see all these arrows are northwest, north and northeast. Very consistent, very, um, very consistent story here that very obviously these, these elevated benzene spikes have some sort of origin that I would put in the northwest to northeast sector. Um, okay, and the next slide. Um, so this is the summary on the VOCs and the benzene. So we measure VOCs and benzene now hourly. We actually increase the sampling frequency since these um, the spikes are so short and so frequent to hourly measurements at the Union Reservoir. We saw a very high abundance of elevated VOCs and benzene during February through March. Um, we saw quite a number of um, benzene observations between 1 and 10 ppb. Um, benzene at the Union Reservoir was much higher than at all other comparison sites, except the single measurements at um, Broomfield um, a couple, three weeks ago. Um, these elevated levels were mostly associated with northwest to um, easterly winds. And um, there's a strong correlation of benzene with methane. It indicates this, um, this methane, uh, that the benzene has likely an oil and gas source. And then levels dropped very steeply in April, May, June, and maybe just pick, about to pick up again right now. And then I think I have one more slide. Is that correct? Oh, well, two more slides. So, you know, in 30 minutes, I only could give you some snapshots. There are other things we measure, other variables um, that I didn't even touch in this presentation, but they are up and running. There's some interesting um, interpretation in those as well. So what I didn't touch today were the nitrogen oxides, the CO2, as well as the particulates, which we measure in two different particle sizes. Um, so we partially you know, do this sometimes later, or you can call me and we can discuss it offline. And then the next slide, the last slide is a, is a summary that just summarizes everything um, we went through. And I just leave this up. And um, that's the last slide I have. So I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions? Dr. Waters? Well, just a really quick, simple question. Um, is, is the criteria for where the two sampling stations are located um, just to get on, on either side of the city and uh, monitor flows from the edges of the city to the edge of the city? 
Is that why it's Union and, and the airport? Yes. So, um, Susan, could you please pull up slide 51? It's uh, yeah, a few ones down. Good question. Give me just a minute. Did you want 53? Um, 51, it should be 51. Mm, two, two up, please. Yes, uh, back one. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so why do we measure it in two places? Um, so the Union Reservoir serves two purposes. You know, as I showed in, in the map that had all the well locations, the Union Reservoir is on the upwind side of the city from where we expect the strongest influence from oil and gas industries, which are mostly located to the, S, to the, to the east of the site. Um, so that was an, an, an early um, preference to have a site somewhere in that general area. And then the, the Western location, um, as you can see, it's on the other side of the city. And the, um, the argument here is that we wanna watch um, how air changes as it travels either east to west or west to east across the city footprint and easterly and westerly winds are about the most the two most prominent um, transport regimes we have here um, so this is largely driven by the motivation to monitor and watch over time the amount of emissions that's added to the air as the air travels to the city with the um, objective to watch the change in emissions and here in particular in greenhouse gas emissions from the city footprint. So this is driven, motivated by sustainability um, arguments. Um, the city has set itself the goal to drive greenhouse gas emissions down. So how do you <laughs> monitor if and how the city is moving towards this goal? So there's, this is actually really difficult to do. Um, but one of the things you can do is, is, is this, this map here, this, this, this cartoon, um, by watching how much is added as the um, air moves over the city. So we're doing exactly the same measurements in both locations using the same instruments, the same techniques, the same protocol for the primary greenhouse gases, which are CO2, which I didn't talk about at all really in the presentation, then methane and also ozone. So in between those three gases, we have about 75, 80% of the climate forcing um, of gases that are um, you know, contributed by, by human activities to, um, to global um, climate forcing. Um, so we're watching all those. Um, and, you know, if, if the, the city achieves its sustainability goal and cuts all this um, greenhouse gas emissions down to zero, then we should see, you know, the same behavior and very, very similar, similar levels um, in air as it travels across the city. And these are the two reference points that, that would be used for, for that comparison. And we already have, I didn't show it, but we've, we've, we've pulled data and compared um, data from the two sides. And we nicely see um, you know, how, how levels change as, as the air gets transported over the city footprint. All Thank right. <coughs> I thought the information was really good, Dr. Dub or Dr. Helmick. Thank you. Um, any other final questions or comments? All right, Do Dr. Helmick, um, as always, your information and knowledge is more than welcome here in Longmont, and we look forward to future updates, reports, and work from you. Yeah. Thanks for letting me to share this with you tonight. All right, great. Thank you, sir. Mayor right. Bagley, if I could uh -huh. just add one, one quick comment as we end. Um, as we mentioned in the Council of Communications, staff is also uh, working with Dr. Helmig to uh, look at an extension of his contract. 
and we will be bringing that contract uh, extension to you for your direction and action um, over the next couple of months. And so we wanted to also let you know that is uh, in the works as well. Great, thanks Dale. All right, let's, uh, if you guys don't mind, um, I was gonna go ahead, do you have a, were you saying goodbye, Paula, or do you have a question? Okay, so um, the next on the agenda, it's actually 9.20, let's go ahead and take five minutes. But when we come back, um, I plan on just taking the list that we talked about and I'll just make motions as we go along uh, based on just kind of the feeling that I heard from people on Saturday. And if somebody has a problem, speak up and we'll just get through the board appointments. But let's take five, okay? See you in five.
All right, we all back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like we're all back. All right. And so Mayor, uh -huh. Go ahead. I might just let council know. I know some council members follow along, and I have been using the voting tool. Because we'll move so quickly, I will not use that. I'm going to take notes. <laughs> just want you to know what I'm up to over here. <laughs> All right. Gee, that's great. That's a show of confidence there. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and start with Art and Public Places Commission. I'm going to move that we appoint Aaron Helzer and Randy Long to two of the five regular member terms ending June 30th, 2023. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Say nay. All right. So that the motion carries unanimously. Just tell me when you're ready, Don. I'm ready, Mayor. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. Then on the Board of Adjustment and Appeals, um, let's see here. Um, I move that we appoint Matthew Mescal and Linda Whitco to the two regular member terms ending June 30th, 2023. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Okay. Then uh, I'm gonna move, so then there's Laura Howe. This was the woman that also applied for the Transportation Commission as well. Um, but that was one where we talked about, there were two regular member terms ending June 30th. So I'm going to move that we appoint Laura Howe as one unexpired alternate member term ending June 30th, 2022. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or debate on this one, Joan? Joan? You're muted, Joan. Um, is this still for the Board of Adjustment and Appeals? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Um, the motion passes unanimously. Just let me know when you're ready, Don. Good to go, Mayor. All right. Library Advisory Board. I move that we appoint Catherine Fink Johnson to the, to the one regular member term ending June 30th, 2025. Second. All opposed, say aye. Aye. All opposed or in favor? Oh, sorry. Oh, it's, it's already late. I'm eating peanut butter and graham crackers for crying out loud. No, it's uh, I boo. Do we appoint Catherine Fink Johnson to one regular member term ending June 30th, 2025? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. <laughs> Who was that? Councilman Martin? Um, I'd rather have Carla Lip. So who, who is nay? Councilman Peck? Yes. Okay. So the motion carries six to one with council member uh, Peck opposed. Um, Longmont Housing Authority, I move that we appoint Arlene Zortman to one regular member term ending June 30th, 2023. Second. Second. And so I appoint, but we ratify. So I'm going to appoint Arlene, but I move that we ratify. So second. Um, let's go ahead and uh, vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. All right, the motion for ratification passes unanimously. Um, I move that we appoint Jonathan Eldon, Edelman, Edelman and Andrew Ulmer to, two, to both of those to the two alternate member terms ending December 31st, 2023 for the Master Board of Appeals. Second. Isn't it Matthew Edelman? It's Jonathan Edelman. Matthew Mescal, we appointed the Board of Adjustment and Appeals. This okay. is the Master Board of Appeals. All in okay. favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Let's move on to the Museum Advisory Board. I move that we appoint Megan Arnold and Thomas Kurtz to two of the three regular member terms ending June 30th, 2023. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Sustainability Advisory Board. Um, Let's go back. Let's go back to that one in just a second. Uh, so let's go on to Transportation Advisory Board. I move that we appoint Joseph Long and Elizabeth R. Osborne to the, to the two regular member terms ending June 30th, 2023 for the Transportation Advisory Board. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 
Opposed? Say nay. All right, the motion carries, uh, passes unanimously. Um, what, uh, and then I was going to, uh, does somebody want to make a motion for waterboard? Allison Gould and Scott Holwick, I think. Yeah, I move. Go ahead, um, Councilman Martin. I move uh, Allison Gould, second okay. waterboard. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by Councilmember Martin and then seconded by Councilmember Peck. Um, all in favor of appointing Allison Gould to the one regular member term ending June 30th, 25 for the water board, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, does somebody want to make a motion for the Sustainability Advisory Board? Um, it looks like Charles Musgrave or Adam Reed. Councilmember Peck? I move that we appoint Charles Musgrave to the Su Sustainability Advisory Board. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, uh, uh, just, Which just term, Mayor? Uh, go ahead. Uh, we, we, one, we, there are two openings, uh -huh. one for an unexpected term, uh, uh, unfulfilled term, and one for a full term. So which of these? So is... um, the, the chair is going to take the motion as being a motion full for term. one regular member term ending June 30th, 2023, the full term. Correct. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. I move that we appoint Adam Reed to one unexpired regular member term ending June 30th, 2022. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by me and was seconded by uh, Councilmember Waters. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. I think that's it, right, Don? That is it, Mayor. The only, uh, we do have a couple new resignations okay. and as you can see, there's still a few vacancies. Our plan is to hold those, advertise okay. for everything in the fall again. Perfect. Bring those then back we, at once. Well, we appreciate it. Good job, guys. That was a, all in all, that was a pretty easy vote. So, Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Then finally, we've got, last but not least, we need to appoint a council liaison to the Longmont Public Media Advisory Board. Who wants to do it? <laughs> council Member Pat, start I'm with you. No, I don't want to. I move that we appoint uh, Councilwoman Christensen to the um, advisory board. I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Anybody else want to do it by any chance? I don't. <laughs> all right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Councilmember Christensen, represent us well. I didn't ask if you're interested, but you're doing it. All right. Let's see. All right. Let's go ahead and do final call public invited to be heard. Let's take just a two to three minute break and see if people call in. I got all kinds of uh, text tonight from our fellow colleagues in surrounding cities. They were tuning in uh, during their own meetings to watch the good doctor give his presentation. What were the comments? Just that they were watching. Oh, okay. It's a lot of interest. Yeah. Anybody in yet, Don? Mayor, we do have one so far. Uh, okay. We're at one minute.
All right, let's go ahead and close it off. It's been three minutes. Let's go ahead and put the uh, put the person on. So, Mayor, we actually have two guests. It looks like the first okay. caller is your number uh, with the number ending four seven zero. You've been unmuted. Go ahead and please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Hey, uh, hi, Mayor, Council Members. Once again, Michael Belmont, 841 Tenacity Drive. Thank you. Uh, first, I'm, I want to complete a thought. I could not because I went beyond my three-minute limit before. But uh, given the massive financial difficulties so many operators, oil and gas operators, are experiencing now, my concern is about who will pay the costs of cleanups for accidents and spills in the event an operator goes out of business. Presumably all of them must carry pollution liability limits, but my questions surrounding this are, one, do we know Cub Creek's limits and how long of a tail it contemplates? Two, do we have some authority and or control as, as to the amount of insurance requirements uh, and tail coverage and length of tail coverage? And three, if so, Given the industry trends with uh, operator financial difficulties so widespread today, shouldn't we require very high limits and long tail coverage? Next, I want to reiterate my urging to retain debt live uh, for our air monitoring, which is so critical moving forward. And of course, thank him for an uh, amazing presentation. Uh, such uh, uh, incredible uh, detail we get from his very high tech uh, evaluation. It would seem from his presentation that when oil and gas in, uh, activity increases, there are spikes in VOCs and methane, uh, i.e. greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. And it's very good and important to know what is happening in that regard, because we depend on that for our health and indeed our very lives. But we see consistently growing, if, if, if we see growing and continuous severe spikes of dangerous compounds like benzene and methane, methane, uh, other than documenting our own demise, what options do we have to mitigate such a threatening trend, like compelling an operator to shut down or at least, at least temporarily? But then the final question is, which is presumed by all of that is, can we differentiate between such emissions from wells subject to our contracts at Union Reservoir and Weld County wells at large? So I think those are important questions I would like the council to uh, investigate because we're a lot is at stake here. Thank you so much. Y'all <laughs> go rest well, I trust. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. All right, next. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 882. I've just unmuted you. Can you hear us? Yes. Um, Scott Conlin, 1014 Fifth Avenue. Again, bicycle on my uh, mayor, city council. Um, I understand you passed the revised uh, ordinance for 2020-28. Uh, um, and thank you for that, um, uh, as presented by Ben Ortiz tonight. Um, I would just like to reiterate uh, that we're also asking that council direct staff and LDDA to help with development of educational materials um, for the dismount zone as well as direct uh, staff and LEDA to develop positive signage uh, to direct riders to the bike lanes where the alleyways are. Part of that discussion that Bicycle Longmont, the LDDA, and the city had was designating the alleyways as a, an active bicycle-friendly zone. Um, this is different than just saying, you know, bicycles are also allowed. We're trying to make it so it's a positive experience uh, we want downtown to be bike friendly, and we're trying to um, encourage that. So I really uh, would like to encourage City Council to direct staff in the LDDA to, to work on this and to work on how to cross uh, the avenues mid-block. Um, one of the issues we have is that we have these crosswalks on the east side of 4th and 5th Avenue that may not be specifically legal, but we need some way to uh, so we're gonna have pedestrians and cyclists in the alleyways going in both directions, some way to warn uh, motorists that um, there's traffic moving both ways and so people feel safe. So I'd like to, for you to consider those things. Um, and if you could uh, 
uh, direct staff uh, and LDDA for those. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else? No, Mayor, that was the last one. All right, great. Let's move on to council and mayor comments. Anybody? Council Mayor Christensen. Um, well, uh, several things were brought up tonight that I think um, we should follow up on. Um, Mr. Belmont's comments about uh, Weld County and, uh, you know, all the things that he just mentioned right now, I think are worth fo following up on. I also think Mr. Conlon's comments are, are very worth commenting on. We don't want to redirect bicycles to the alley and have them competing with trucks and getting run over. So um, <laughs> I think we're going to have to spend a little more time with that and um, uh, talking to Mr. Conlon and the bike community. Um, I am also concerned, I know we don't want to hear this, but the prairie dogs. <laughs> you know, we just got this notice today about this issue. And if the prairie dogs are set to be exterminated in two days, that gives us really no time unless we can put a hold on that. Um, I, I, I looked at that map. It is not, it, it's crazy and it's obviously a way to wiggle around the ordinance. Uh, I find that disturbing. If somebody else would like to make a motion that we um, put a hold on that uh, moving forward, I would uh, I would support it. Thank you. Council Member Martin. I would have to ask whether we have the authority to put a hold on a permit since that is an operational um, task of the city staff. However, um, I will reassure Council Member Christensen that um, the, the area which lies in, in Ward 2, in my ward, um, I have, have plans um, to inspect the area to see whether um, that very complicated polygon excludes um, any live holes because uh, it seems like in the in the letter of the law, um, they may be within their rights if there are no active burrows um, out, outside the polygon. Um, but uh, we can look tomorrow. So just to let council know, um, while that was going on, I was um, bringing, I was asking staff questions. Um, Here's where it hinges, section 7.06.020 in the definitions. It says an active prairie dog habitat means the smallest possible area of a polygon encompassing all active prairie dog burrows on a property. Um, that's an important definition. Um, I then went and looked at Marion Webster and Oxford about the definitions of polygons. And so the, the reality is I've asked Don to, the big issue is um, encompassing all active boroughs. And so to what Council Member Martin said, I've asked Don to um, work with code enforcement and um, natural resources staff to evaluate the active area. That's what we have to really look at. Dr. Waters? Yeah, on the same thing. I, I'm, I'm sympathetic as well, Polly, to the concern here, I just, uh, what's the right way to get at it for me? And, um, Harold, I'm assuming you're following up with Don and others on in, on the enforcement options. Don, um, Eugene, and Teresa. Yeah. Um, one of the comments that was made tonight is this is a this is a repeat offender, if you will, or someone has had prior we, with whom we've had we've had prior issues relative to prairie dog uh, extermination. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't know that you know that that's true, but but if that is true, what are our options for dealing with developers or anyone else uh, who simply ignores or or looks for ways to work around the ordinance? That's what I have to talk to Eugene about because I think the ordinance is silent to that, um, and so I need to work with legal to see. What, what are the options and, and do we need to look at bringing something like that back? And do we have, an, is there an option to, do, do we, is there, are there means for us 
to, to, to prohibit or, or delay what is apparently scheduled for Thursday? Do you know that? Eugene, you're gonna have to jump in and help me on that one. Sure, uh, Eugene May, uh, city attorney, you know, I was discussing with Harold offline that uh, we could contact the applicant, we could do a compliance check um, and, you know, verify the information in the application. I think uh, I haven't reviewed the application. I heard about this issue uh, during this council meeting, perhaps when uh, you all have. have. So, you know, I, it's hard for me to say without having the basics information like having reviewed the application i don't know anything about the site um so you know i i saw the pictures too i don't know where those pictures are uh so i'm not going to give any opinion until i can determine what the facts are and then compare them to the ordinance uh but certainly i think it's within our authority to do a compliance check if we have a complaint that's the way code works um, that seems according to normal city processes. And um, we'll look at the issue of repeat offenders. Um, I looked at the Prairie Dog Ordinance as this meeting was ongoing. Uh, doesn't address that issue. Um, and I'm not aware of anywhere in the code that does. I think you just bring a violation and then they have a, another uh, incident uh, and we're in municipal court, we would, you know, argue that's a aggravating factor for uh, the penalty phase. Is it fair to us to assume that the kind of follow up you described, Eugene, will happen or do we need to give direction on that? Is that what you no, will happen? It will happen. We're going to examine the site. Um, if, you know, that's the key. We're going to examine the site if if they're active boroughs outside is of the boundaries that they've defined, then that's a different issue and we have right. to act appropriately. Unrelated to that, but related to uh, the bicycle ordinance, I thought I heard Ben um, acknowledge that the things that we heard from Mr. Conlon when he called in again, in terms of signage and education and delayed enforcement, that those things were all gonna happen. And that yes. uh, we really need to give direction. Yes. The staff has already acknowledged this is what they're following up on. Is that fair? That's correct. Yeah, thanks. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Beckley. Uh, on a different issue, I want to give kudos to LDDA and the city of Longmont and our transportation planner, Phil Greenwald, um, on the downtown lane closures and extension for the restaurants. Uh, Phil gave a, uh, an update presentation at the NADA meeting last week. And uh, it went over very well, and there were a lot of uh, questions from the, the other elected officials. They thought this was a great thing that Longmont did, and they were very impressed with how we got, uh, not me, the uh, city and uh, Phil, to work with CDOT and actually make that happen. So this is a very positive thing, and it, it, the other cities and elected officials um, expressed uh, kudos and uh, appreciation for Longmont and are probably going to see how they can make that work in their cities. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. It's a good thing that they did and we should be proud. Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, last Friday, I went for a ride with a police officer. Um, for just to kind of just a, a ride along. Uh, I did it Friday night and, you know, we had some really good conversation. I think I was there for I, like maybe three or four, between three and four hours with him. And we just kind of scoped around and um, I had the opportunity to witness um, our officers interact with the public under stressful situations and just casual conversation um, just, you know, seeing residents wave and, um, you know, it was, so I've had family members, I've had loved ones who've had run in with the law. So nothing in there surprised me. Nothing was unusual and everything that, you know, my own assumptions or my own thoughts, it was like, yeah, that's, 
that it was pretty much accurate. And I think that's just from, from my own personal experience. Um, but in looking at, and, you know, I want to get into my perspective of, you know, the whole notion of defunding the police and what does that mean? Um, oftentimes when I, and, you know, and, and I'll be honest, what I'm hearing is, you know, morale for, for some, it's, it's very, it's difficult. And I think being an educator for now 26 years, it's difficult for teachers who, to hear all the time, you're terrible, you need this, you need that, we're gonna take funding away. And it's, it's degrading and it's demoralizing and it's, 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 it's a strain on the, on the psyche and the soul. Um, and I see that happening with, with our officers. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I've been doing the work of social justice for the last 30 years. In Southern California, I mar marched with the Chicano movement. I've dedicated my last 30 years, my entire adult life in equity, institutional racism, looking at systems of oppression and dismantling those systems. And oftentimes when I hear people on both sides, um, to either call for defund the police or, you know, or bashing that notion of funding the police, defunding the police, you know, I ask them, what do you think that means? And oftentimes it's, it's not an accurate portrayal. So, you know, really when we look at defunding the police and I've asked our, I've asked our state representatives, uh, Leslie Herod, I asked, uh, Representative Herod, I asked, you know, what, define that for me. What does defund the police mean? And it's really looking at how we allocate our funding. Is it more towards a criminal system or more towards uh, a rehabilitation where we have diversion? We have, um, and we see, I see it in our departments, in this public safety department, the core team, leads, the ANGEL initiative. All these institutions or all these programs that we have in place, that is what we had been striving for since I first started, you know, back in the <laughs> late 80s, early 90s. I mean, that's what we want. We want to move away from this idea of just criminalizing people and throwing them all into jail, starting within the schools, the school to prison pipeline, moving away from that and providing opportunities for people to rehabilitate. Um, and then I'm going to throw in my own personal experience, and I share that with the officer I rode with. Um, and what I have seen as a resident and a parent who's had to call the police on their children. Um, my daughter, when she was overcoming um, just uh, suicide, suicidal ideation, there was a time we had to call the police. And this was back in 2013. And I tell you, they weren't even in the house for a minute before I realized I made a big mistake in calling. Um, they had her pinned down. It was, it was frightening to see, and it was traumatic. And it took also years of therapy for us to reconcile that. Um, then we fast forward to about a year and a half ago when my son was having, he was having a um, meltdown. He was having a really hard time. My daughter and her roommate helped intervene. They took him to the apartment and, and you know, and he was, he was getting really agitated and just very angry. And so they ended up calling the police and I went out, by the time I went out there, cause he was really mad at me. And so, you know, I went out there after the police were there and they had somebody, I believe from the core team and they spent almost an hour with him and they talked to him and they talked him down. So they de-escalated the situation and the time and commitment where I was really mad. And I'm like, what are you doing? Just, you know, <laughs> you know I was so frustrated, but they took the time. So, you know, what I see this department doing, this is on the right track. And I don't want to dismantle a system that's working. And I think we have to be supportive of that. And that is what, um, you know, the community is about. It, when I've had a chance, I had a chance to meet with um, our interim police chief, uh, Rob Spenlow. And, you know, and he's acknowledged we're, we have ways to go. And that's always what we strive for as an organization is how we reflect, we look for ways to grow and we make the appropriate changes. So, you know, I think, I think we are on the right track. And I, you know, when I, when I even use the term, you know, defunding the police, what does that mean? What I, I look at what my context of it means and it's really just advocating for um, opportunities for people to rehabilitate 
and um, and find other avenues for um, you know rather than going through the court system or criminal or the jail system. So that's. Um, and then that kind of brings me into the next thing. I don't know if some of you received an email from Bob Norris about, um, you know, bringing up the language, language, um, language barriers. Um, and this is something back when we had our retreat, we talked about, um, you know, I had talked, we talked about equity. One of the things that I really wanted to see was this, um, a, some type of commission or council around equity and human relations. And I want to bring it up again. Um, and this is something that I saw that he included in the mail about, or in the email about recommending some kind of board or commission to address issues of inequity and really looking at it at the policy level rather than just the, just a diverse, the diversity level, because those are two different aspects. I think what the LMAC is doing it addresses that diversity inclusion. That's its own set, and that's a huge task. To have one that really delves into policy of equity and how we as an organization and institution can um, bridge those gaps of inequity, that's what I think this, um, this so I'm pushing that again. But, <laughs> and I'm gonna keep pushing it, but that's, that's what I have to say. Uh, thanks. Anybody else? Aaron, I just want to chastise you for talking too much tonight. I don't have anything to say. So city manager. No comments, Mayor Council. Eugene. He's got no comments. All right. Do I have a no vote? comments, Mayor. Yeah, I already assumed, buddy. Get off the screen. <laughs> Although that thing with uh, Mayor Coombs, that was freaky. When he just well, I feel, I feel, well, he was supposed to just started giggling. He was supposed to actually just start naturally saying, all right, let's move on to, to item F of the consent agenda. But he just started that, that, giggling. That was a crazy flashback. He would just started giggling like a goofball. So I was like, get going, Dennis. Say something. But anyway. Welcome. You sir. had another hand raised, I saw. Oh, who? Me. Oh, Councilmember Beck? I move to adjourn. Oh, I'll second that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries unanimously. See you next time. See you tomorrow, Harold. See you. Brian, call.